Okay, Mr. Marshall, it is 6.31. Amherst Media has joined us. They are in the attendees. Uh, you do have a quorum of the board. It looks like you have a full board. I believe we're good to go. All right, thank you, Pam. You're welcome. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of January 31st, 2024. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.32 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is accessible on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, where the Zoom link is listed at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and return to mute. Bruce Colvin. Here. Yeah. Red Hartwell. Red Hartwell is present. Jesse Major. Present. Janet McGowan. Here. Johanna Newman. Here. Karen Winter. Here. And I, Doug Marshall, am present also. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. To the general public, the general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate by the planning board chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. Okay, uh, our first item on our agenda this evening here now at 635 is approval of minutes. And so we'll start with the December 6th minutes, which were distributed in our packets. Uh, board members, are there any comments on those minutes? All right, I don't see any hands raised. Uh, assuming you all read them. Ah, yo, Jesse. Yep, I, I read them. I thought they were great. I was just going to move to approve the minutes. All right, thank you for that motion. I will Anybody second. Wanna, Johanna, you got there second. I'll second the motion. All right, thank you. Thank you both. Last call for comments on the December 6th minutes. All right, we'll go through uh, another roll call. Starting with you, Bruce. Are you in favor of approving the minutes? I am approved. 
Fred. I approve. Thank you. Jesse. Aye. Uh, Janet. Aye. Johanna. Aye. And Karen. Aye. <clears throat> I'm an I as well. It is unanimous, seven in favor, with no abstentions or absences or uh, nays. All right, we'll go on to the December 20th minutes. Likewise, does anybody have any comments or suggestions about those? All right, does anybody want to make a motion? Johanna? I move to approve the minutes. Thank you. Okay. And Jesse. I second. Okay. Thank you both. Any further, any comments at all before we go back uh, through the roll? Okay. All right. I'll go uh, reverse alphabetical this time. So, Karen, you're first. Approve. Thank you, Karen. Johanna. Aye. Janet. Aye. Jesse. Aye. Fred? Aye. And Bruce? Aye. I'm an aye as well. Again, it's unanimous with no abstentions or nays. OK, so that's the two sets of minutes we have this evening. Time is 6.38. At this point, we'll go to public comment period. Uh, I see in the public uh, attendees, in addition to Amherst Media, I see David Zomek, Elizabeth Veerling, George Ryan, Maura Keane, and Susanna Muspratt. So any members of the public that want to make a comment on something that's not on tonight's agenda? Okay, I guess uh, none of the public in our attendance wants to make a comment at this time. All right, we'll go ahead to item three on the agenda, uh, which is a continuation of a public hearing. Time is 639. In accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, these public hearings have been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard. This public hearing is continued from December 20th, 2023. This is SBR 2024-03. Applicant is Town of Amherst. Location is 191. West Pomeroy Lane, request site plan review approval to install two ADA universally accessible six foot wide crushed stone pads, accessible footbridges and other site improvements, including boardwalks, benches, signage, kiosks, pipe racks, shade structures, and upgrades to existing parking area and a connector path under article three, section 3.335 and Article 8 of the Zoning Bylaw. Located in the RO, RN, FPC, and FEMA floodplain overlay zoning districts. Map 19D, parcel 10. OK, uh, this, as I said, is continued from December 20th. Uh, are there any board members who want to make a disclosure at this time regarding their relationship with the participants in this uh, hearing? All right, I don't see any hands raised for public disclosure. And I suspect that Dave Zomek is back in the panel so that you can make your uh, presentation. You want to welcome back, Dave. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me OK? Thank you very much for having me. Um, if I could, I'll try to launch right in and be as efficient with your time as possible. Um, I certainly may defer or lean uh, to and on Chris and Nate, uh, as this is a town project and they have been, uh, as with many town projects, uh, quite involved with the evolution of the project. But I think um, before I get started, I have, I did review the draft minutes, 
the draft conditions, the draft findings. I thought um, back on December 20th, it seems like a long time ago now, but it wasn't all that long. We did have a very thorough and robust conversation about this project. And just to remind the board, it is essentially, as, as the chair read off, uh, uh, a modest trail project with associated parking. Um, that is really, uh, at this point, what this is all about. Although Hickory Ridge is a much larger endeavor on the town's part that may include much larger elements, i.e. the future use of the clubhouse area, perhaps for uh, 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 another town building, uh, perhaps for a fire station, perhaps for affordable housing. Uh, uh, what the town's before you uh, with tonight and, and in this application is really uh, just some accessible trails and and parking that will open up this beautiful area for hiking, biking, bird watching, and and the like, and make it uh, as accessible as we can. And just to remind everybody, we do have some grant money pending, and our goal is to try to get the project done uh, this summer. Um, and in fact, uh, um, we have um, uh, bid out the project, and and uh, our hope is. Uh, to get bids in um, uh, as early as this week and and see where we are. So uh, essentially after reading all of those materials, um, and again, I will lean on Chris and Nate when it comes to uh, any discussion of the, the proposed waivers, but I did just want to acknowledge that uh, we are fully aware that we will need to go before the ZBA for a special permit for the bridge, boardwalk and shade structures in the FPC. And our plan is to do that in the next, uh, you know, four to six weeks as the ZBA schedule allows. Um, I did want to acknowledge as part of the discussion, there was recommendations from the planning board uh, that we increase the number of bike loops. And I think that's reflected uh, now in our plans. Um, I think one of the major sticking points of our discussion last uh, in December was um, um, the parking plan as proposed, and I believe that um, you have all seen that we have revised that parking plan. Um, we have acknowledged that um, uh, the existing islands that are there already uh, will, will remain. Um, we have also asked the fire department and received a response from them. They have both reviewed the plan that was developed by staff and they also visited the site and they are um, they came back with a very resounding, confident um, uh, um, uh, uh, acknowledgement that they can easily get emergency vehicles down in the eastern access, the <clears throat> excuse me, the proposed main access to the parking lot for the trails. So that includes uh, in speaking with Assistant Chief Olmstead. Um, staff confirmed that uh, uh, an ambulance or uh, appropriate fire vehicle uh, could easily get down that eastern access. Uh, the the grades and slope uh, were not um, uh, were not a, a problem, and the turning radius was um, found to be adequate for their vehicles. So we confirmed that with uh, AFD, and then we also want to acknowledge that. As the project evolves um, in the future, um, we will need to come back through appropriate boards and committees, including the planning board, ZBA, CONCOM, et cetera, as the project um, uh, evolves over time. Uh, but for now, it is essentially a trail project with associated parking. And I think I'll stop there and uh, look to Chris or Nate if we wanted to go through any specific, any more specific uh, details of the plan or the waivers. Okay, and thanks, I'm Dave. Take your questions. I do see Chris's hand, and uh, I will comment that at least in the paper packet that I received, there was no revised parking plan, although I did see a parking plan in some of the email correspondence that was forwarded to us. 
parking plan was included in the email. It came after the um, packets were put together last Friday, so um, that's why we had to send it out in email. Um, but I wanted to mention that um, the fire department also looked at the width of the driveway, and they felt that was adequate to get their um, equipment down into the parking lot and solve any problems that needed to be solved there. Um, so I'm, I'm willing to go through um, conditions and findings if you are ready for that or um, ask questions. Okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, Janet? Um, I Thank you for getting that information from the fire department. I feel much better um, getting their advice and understanding that. Um, I wonder if we might want to just put the parking plan up on the, if we can put it on the board to look at it. Um, I looked at it very briefly. Um, I just, I, and so I just to look at that, but um, the question I have, and I think it might have been answered at the last hearing, is the design review board had made a recommendation about the handrails on the bridges, um, having them um, sort of stick out one feet on each side and the slopes. I think you took care of that, but I just I just wanted to make sure that it was covered. We did. Thank you, Janet, for raising both those questions. And yes, that that will be included on the design of the bridges. Um, we acknowledged, yeah, that there, there would need to be an approach to uh, each one of the bridges um, that would achieve the, you know, the ADA um, status that we're looking for. And also, um, I'm not going to get the correct terminology, but extension of the handrails um, on those bridges. So that will be achieved in the, uh, the construction process. I also wanted to just mention that I believe there was some at our December 20th discussion, there was some... Um, reference to the westernmost access um, closer to the old clubhouse. And essentially what we plan to do there, since the easternmost access will become the, the trail, um, the trail access and parking, uh, our plan is to really um, cordon off the so cordon off the western entrance. So essentially that would be bollards with uh with uh, some sort of um not gated, but it would probably be a cabled access only accessible by emergency uh, vehicles, police and fire, um, so that we would not have people parking near or interfering with access to that building. As I stated uh, on the 20th, our hope and our goal is to bring that building down. That building will not be rehabbed. We have done a complete assessment of the building. It is not salvageable but we need to come up with uh, funding to remove it and prepare the site for future uses. But in the meantime, uh, we would work with the fire department on a, on a simple cabled access uh, bollard, uh, bollards and cable there that the fire department and the police department could access. Um, and that will also help with just safety around the building and also make it very clear that the public should park in this um, lot that you see before you on the screen. There was one other thing I wanted to mention. Uh, as you may know, the fire department has been using that building for training for months now, and um, they very much enjoy training in the building, uh, but I don't want that to, as much as that training is important for our fire department, um, we do want to bring that building down at some point in the near near future. So I'll stop there and uh, one of one of our staff here can answer any questions you might have about the parking. Doug, okay. could, I, could I talk a little bit about the parking lot? Sure, Janet. So I went back to the parking lot and I did notice the vegetative islands, which I hadn't remembered. And then I I also noticed um, what Christine Brestrup had pointed out about the parking lot being quite a bit down from the street. So there's not a need for some kind of vegetative barrier. And then the plan looks good to me. And I started to think about this parking lot more like the Sweet Alice Trail parking lot, which is super simple. And, you know, it's just like people pull in, you know, ride their bikes, stop, and then just go out and walk. So it's not, you know, so I, I think that I think this current plan is is very good. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Janet. All right. Um... Sounds like, or it looks like I'm not seeing any other hands of initial questions or comments. So Chris, uh, do you want to go through your findings and conditions and uh, 
And, and uh, you know, I've got the list of the waivers that were recorded in the minutes from our meeting on the 20th. But uh, that's, that's all I have. That's also what I have. Am I muted? No. No, you, you are not muted. Yeah. So, um... Uh, hold on, Chris. Bruce, uh, your hand has gone up. Are you? Do you want to talk before Chris goes or not? Well, it's in conjunction, really. It's just that uh, with the plan that's up, and I thought maybe I'd make this point while the plan is still up. Uh, the first waiver about the, the uh, uh, steepness of the slope over five mentions in the waiver thirty feet, but the drawing here says five to ten feet. So we might want to amend that waiver. So I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm into the waiver discussion, but. But of course, as I said, while the plan's up, we might as well just verify that the waiver probably does need waiver number seven probably item waiver number seven probably needs to be modified from thirty feet to five to ten feet. Okay. Is that all? That's it for the moment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Please proceed. Would you like me to read the waivers first and then go to the conditions? Yeah, I think that would be good. Okay, um, they've asked for, we have asked for a waiver of the lighting plan because there's no plan for additional lighting here. Um, we've asked for a waiver of the traffic impact statement because we don't believe that there's going to be enough traffic to have an impact. Um, <clears throat> we've asked for a sign waiver from section 8.101 because um, signs in the residential zoning districts are normally limited to 12 square feet in area. And here we, possibly um, in, uh, exceed that. We've asked for a waiver from uh, section 8.103 for signs over four feet in height, again, in the residential district, um, because some of these signs will be higher than that. We've asked for a sign waiver from section 8.3 for more than one or two signs not exceeding a total of 12 square feet in the FPC zoning district. <clears throat> so those are the sign waivers that we've asked for. Um, in terms of parking waivers, uh, the first one is a parking request waiver from section 7.105 for lighting and 7.112 for screening. So the lighting is because uh, we don't expect that this, uh, this area, this conservation area will be used after dark and so there won't be a requirement for more lighting. And we've already talked about screening and Janet uh, agrees that um, the screening that's there right now is adequate. Um, number seven, parking waiver from section 7.102. Again, we've talked about that. The slope of the existing entry drive is over 5% for uh, five feet. Um, and so that uh, we're asking for that waiver to be granted. Um, the, there's another uh, waiver of, of the parking requirement for section 7.106, which is the width of the two-way drive um, and I think Rob Mora went out and actually measured it. It's less than 18 feet. And what I've written here, more like 12 to 13, I think, again, we should substitute the actual numbers that Rob came up with, which is more like um, 14 feet six to 16 feet six. Um, so I will do that. And then it's actually a lot wider at the mouth of the driveway. I think it's 48 feet. Is that right? Correct. Am I reading that correctly? Um, and then there's a parking waiver from section 7.111 for landscaped islands, but I don't think we actually need that anymore since we have existing landscaped islands, so we don't need that waiver. Do we need the screening waiver? I don't believe we need the screening waiver because there is a there is a mound. Um, it sounds like the existing conditions effectively screen it. So yes, we can There's take a, that off of number six here. Number six, okay, screening. Yes. Um, there's a berm there, and there's also a lot of vegetation along the roadway mm -hmm. edge. Um, so that's it for the waivers. Does anyone have any objection to the waivers? So I wanted to ask about the signage and um, why would, I mean, putting aside for the moment whether we approve the waivers, 
we haven't seen the signs. We don't know how big they are. Uh, so would we put a condition on that they have, you guys have to return when you've got a plan for the signs? That's a good idea, yep. That would be fine. I mean, I kind of feel like why should we even approve a waiver now just because there isn't any plan to refer to and um, simply put a condition on that when you've got a signed plan, you come back and we'll either give you waivers or not. I think if you don't mind my saying it, um, we did have information about the signs and it was in the packet for December 20th. Um, I don't have access to that right now other than paper copies. Nate might be able to bring it up, but we did have I can images, uh, or Pam can bring it up. We did have images of those signs and they're similar to the ones that are at the Sweet Alice um, in terms of parking signs and also a sign that is, um, you know, meant to say, what is this place? And um, okay. so some of these signs are in here already. And I don't know which, oh, example, kiosk and signs. Maybe you could try that. So the kiosk is, you know, something on its own that we're asking to have brought back, I believe. But this sign here on the post is six feet high, so that's taller than four feet high. And um, this sign here is actually um, 12 feet square, but we don't know if there is going to be another one. We, we see one, but if there's another one, that would exceed the 12 square feet that's allowed in the residential zoning district. Mm -hmm. So we want to be able to accommodate the height that's taller than four feet and a, an area of signs that's more than um, 12 square feet limit. Uh, okay. you know, so would it, would it be accurate to say that the plan for the signs is going to be consistent with what we're seeing on the screen? Um, yes, except we don't know. Do we know the locations of these signs? And we also have interpretive signs that are going to be um, put forward, and we haven't seen those yet. So I think it's a good idea to grant the waiver, but then also to make a condition that uh, the applicant, the town, needs to come back once they have their signs um, figured out and show where they are and what they look like. Okay. Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah, I would just add, Doug, I'm fine with coming back. I will say on the plan, it does show the the the, the new plan that was submitted just recently. Um, it does show the parking area identification sign out near West Pomeroy um, and then the kiosk location as well, um, closer okay. to the trail. Um, okay, great. But, but we're fine with, with coming back. Um, Okay, great. With, with no, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to make you come back. I just uh, wasn't clear that we had enough information to know what was going on. It sounds like there is a fair amount of information here, but there may be more signs than we see on this plan. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see two hands. Bruce. I think Joanna was before me. I was, and then I went off, but then I realized um, I... I'm glad to hear that we're having the conversation about signs. I do remember the conversation from December where we talked about how these signs were going to be consistent with the overall signage plan that I think we as a board kind of signed off on in concept for all the conservation areas in town. Um, I remember having that conversation when we were discussing Sweet Alice, that this was going to be kind of the, the template look of signage in town. And I remember a conversation about the dog park and us wanting to get that signage in conformity with that standard that we had set. So um, I'm satisfied with the kind of greeting sign and the kiosk sign. And then my one question was, I think I remember from December, Dave walking through the trail plan and demarcating the locations for those signs as well. And so I'm feeling like, I mean, we could maybe check and confirm that those locations are on the map, but I'm satisfied with that and don't feel like I would need the town to come back. Okay. All right, uh, Bruce. Uh, I'm satisfied with uh, granting the waiver now. Uh, uh, 
for the for the res the parts of it that are in the residential zone, it seems to me very clear that, that this is not a residential zone, and it also seems to me clear that these kind of uses really depend on need signs, and we ought to be encouraging them. So, I would, uh, for that reason, support the waiver now, with a view to not having any impediment to having uh, the kind of interpretive signs and having them at the size where they can be uh, seen and appreciated and so forth, and uh, and then. Uh, having the condition that they come back and then we can be more specific if we choose. But I'm supportive of a waiver for this kind of project uh, where signage is, is really quite important. Okay, great. Thanks, Bruce. Janet? So um, are, would the interpretive, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> would the interpretive signs be very similar to the ones that are um, on the trail near my house, Dave, I, I can't be blanking the bluebird trail. Like, a, Are those the kind of interpretive signs? Because those are excellent. And they're not really that obtrusive. Um, do you know the signs I'm talking about? It's yes, right no, on. I do, I do. Um, I was formulating an answer. Yeah, I mean, they would be similar. Um, I appreciated Johanna's reminder about just about an overall sign plan and consistency. And I think, you know, to be perfectly honest, I think the town has struggled with that. And, and um, you know, um, I worked on the, on the dog park and Groff Park and Kendrick Park. And I think we're, we're doing better than we were five, 10 years ago, but I still think we need to do better. Uh, to Bruce's point, I think signage um, or signs, I don't like to use the word signage, but signs are very important um, for uh, wayfinding, for placemaking, uh, and for interpretation and education. And I will tell you, I can rattle off areas, conservation areas or recreation areas where we have empty kiosks. And when it go, when when um, when I go there, it um, my blood pressure goes up. So I think we need to do better, and I think we're we're trying. And I think if we have a standard like you saw earlier with some of those signs, I think that's a a step in the right direction. To Janet's uh, question, um, yes, Janet, I think the interpretive signs we we are really planning. I think there I think a, an area can have too many signs. I think there's something. I, I think sign pollution really exists. So we're we're kind of going on the minimal track here out on Hickory to start off. Um, if we add signs later, that's that's well and good. But I think most of the signs to begin with will be simple kiosks at trail breaks and smaller signs. Um, but I don't think we will have, I think uh, uh, Bluebird Meadow has something on the order of five to seven signs, um, something like that. And they're low to the ground and those are wonderful. We may go to that, but I think initially these will be small kiosks, two-sided kiosks with uh, trail maps and educational information. Um, you know, it could be information exchange there too. Have you seen this bird or that animal, wildlife sightings, things like that. Mm -hmm. It is a big place. It's It, it really kind of um, feels very much like um, a Wentworth Farm Conservation Area. It's 150 acres and it feels bigger than that when you get out there. The solar will make it a little smaller, I think, to be honest, once it's fenced and up, but it's a big place. So I think people will want some directional signage, uh, but we don't want to put too many out. They're also very expensive. <laughs> so budgets will be a, a real consideration. Okay. Thank you, Janet and David. Chris? So um, Nate might want to bring up the plan of the um, proposed work because it shows 11 sign locations. And Nate and I were talking about what these signs might look like. And we were thinking that they could look like the writer's walk signs, which are very low key, and um, but really manage to you know have a lot of information on them. Um, so Park and CDBG. Proposed grant work is the name of the plan that I'm looking at, but Nate probably knows, or, or Pam knows, which one it is. It's the colorful one. Was it in this packet, Chris, or 1220? Yes, it was in this packet, yeah. Okay, yeah. hold on, I'm in the wrong packet. Here we go. 
there's no shortage of maps and plans for Hickory. Can everybody so see it? Little red yeah. squares yeah. with a person walking and then sort of looking down. And those little red squares represent um, the signs. And on the uh, loop at the, um, the, the west side or the left side, there are three signs. Um, one at location one, one at location two, and then one at the first location that Pam pointed out to the right, right? Uh, yes, there. There's one. Yep. And then there's one up along um, what will be the connector at location four. There's going to be a sign there. And then along the north-south trail, um, if you go all the way over to the right side where West Street is, there's going to be a sign at West Street. And one um, at the end of that drive, uh, number seven, there's going to be a sign there. And if you keep going down along the uh, path, there's going to be a sign right there where someone is pointing. And number five also has a sign. And just up to the left from there is another sign. And then I think there are th uh, two more on the plan. Um, right there, and then just to the north. Yeah, so there are, I think I counted 11 altogether. So there are 11 sign locations shown here. And Would, um, there, would there be a sign at the extreme north of this yeah, trail? Yes, yes, there will. That is a large kiosk location. So there will be a kiosk there. Okay. And there will be a kiosk at the um, parking lot where you get out of your car and you start onto the trail. Okay. And there's a star there and you can see that. Yep. And, yeah. and to be honest, some of these, they may change slightly. I, I don't want to give the board the impression that these are the exact locations because honestly, you know, we will be navigating wetlands, streams, you know, these, we've looked at those things, but, you know, um, they may change slightly based on user patterns. If we find people you know, not using a particular trail or or segment of trail or getting lost at a particular spot, we might move a directional sign north or south or east or west. So I just want to put it out there that these may move slightly. Uh, I know in the upper uh, right, you can see the small pond and there is a sign kind of interpreting that small pond way in the, the upper upper central area there talking about, you know, what wildlife you might see there, reptiles and amphibians that might, you know, live there, those kinds of things. Uh, another sign we planned was to talk about the solar project. What are the benefits of the solar projects? Why is this here? You know, some people are going to be surprised or some people may not be pleased. It's there, a 26 acre solar project, but we'll talk about and we'll work with with uh, Pure Sky on uh, some some verbiage there to talk about the benefits of of solar and uh, what that project brings both to Amherst but also to Springfield as the off taker. So, okay, great. All right, board members, other other comments, other questions for Dave or Nate. Um, and then if there aren't any comments, uh, we will want to know how you feel about these waivers, if there's any objection to the waivers that, that Chris read, along with the uh, sort of edits that came along with some of the numbers. All right, so I'm still not seeing any hands from the board. Why don't I see if anybody in the public wants to make a comment at this time? So members of the public, this is your chance to comment or pose questions uh, regarding this project at Hickory Ridge. Uh, you can speak for up to three minutes. Okay, I am not seeing any hands from the public. So we'll come back to the board. Any last comments before we start to try to make 
aspects, emotions. Or Chris, do you want to talk about conditions first? Yeah. Why don't we read through the conditions? And the conditions are listed in the uh, minutes of December 20th. Um, so I don't know if Pam can bring those up or if Nate can. Pam looks like she's working on it. Where are they listed on that? In oh, those the minutes? bottom of page eight, that's where they start in the minutes of December 20th. Oh, okay. And these minutes had, or these conditions had been circulated to you. I think it was sort of last minute on the day of uh, December 20th, but um, you had seen them before the meeting and then we talked about them at the meeting. Here we go. Oops. Yep. So thanks, Pam. So the number one uh, condition down at the bottom of the page. Oh, condition. I'm sorry. I was stuck on waivers. Sorry. Yep. Yep. There you go. The project shall be built according to plans approved by the planning board on whatever date you approve them on. <clears throat> the project shall be managed according to the management plan approved by the planning board on, again, whatever date you approve this. Hours of operation shall be from dawn to dusk. Number four, changes to the project and or substantial changes to any approved site plans shall be submitted to the planning board for review and approval prior to the work taking place. The purpose of this submittal shall be for the planning board to approve the change and to determine that the changes are de minimis or significant enough to require a modification of the site plan review approval. Number five, can you scroll down? Thanks. The proposed shade structure and sign designs shall be submitted to the planning board for review and approval after review by the design review board and prior to installation. And number six is the applicant shall obtain a special permit from the zoning board of appeals to locate structures, including shade structures, bridges, and boardwalks within the FPC flood prone conservancy district under section three point two three one of the zoning bylaw prior to uh, construction of these structures and then we added a last um, condition during this discussion tonight which was that the uh, sign plan shall be brought back for review and approval by the planning board in, uh, prior to installation yeah i mean uh, number five already refers to sign designs uh, number five Yes. Number five. Um, it, yeah. OK, so is that good enough? You don't need to have them. I mean, that I mean. Should that be a separate? Um, well, let's see. Um, Bruce, you've got your hand up. You want to weigh in? It's I was going to move approval. Uh, oh, OK. But uh, I'll move approval uh, with the uh, number five re relating to the shade structures and uh, and let's say a new number six relating to the signs, just for clarity, so that the two items are separate and clear. Uh, so I would move uh, uh, approval of the application uh, uh, based on the documents submitted on the uh, waivers and the conditions uh, as uh, as reviewed during the meeting. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Do you also want to say something about Section 11.24 um, and just acknowledge that the project yeah. meets the relevant criteria of Section 11.24 as a finding? Yeah, we ought to do that. I think I would suggest option one. So, Bruce. Yes, uh, I'll, I'll agree with you, Doug, and I'll uh, and add to the conditions uh, and the findings. Uh, um uh, 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 that okay. the project meets uh, basically and the and that uh, the board finds and then the text of option one as part of the motion all right and close the public hearing yes thank you i would do that too anybody got a hamburger they want at this point <laughs> <laughs> it always takes all of us to get through these uh it do it do 
Okay. Okay. Uh, that's so, the motion. Um, and then we're going to want to we're going to list at least some of those waivers. We will um, list the waivers that we talked about, um, yeah. including, which are. So we've got we've got we've down to eight waivers: lighting plan, traffic impact, three sign waivers, one parking waiver for section seven point one zero five. The screening comes off. Parking waiver for seven one zero two, for at least the first five feet. Parking waiver for seven one zero six. Uh, for widths between 14.6 and 16.6. So seems like we would want to grant the waivers, impose the conditions, uh, and close the hearing. And declare the finding. Yes. Yes. So Bruce okay. made that um, motion and Bruce has made that motion. And now that we've hammered it into shape, Jesse's got his hand up. I would like to second that motion. Okay. All right. Is that uh, a little clearer than mud for everybody to understand what we're doing? Mud seems an appropriate metaphor for this project. Okay, so uh, we have a we have a motion and it's been second, second dead. Uh, any members of the board want to comment or question or amend that cumbersome motion? Okay, no, I don't see any hands. So in that case, we will do a roll call, I guess, to approve to make all those actions that we've now that Pam and Chris have conscientiously written down for us. Uh, Bruce, you can start. I approve. Thank you. Fred. I approve. Jesse. I approve. Janet. I approve. Johanna. Aye. Karen. I approve. And I'm an I as well. It's unanimous again. We're having a unanimous evening. Okay. So, Dave, thanks for your time. Thanks for coming back. Thank, thanks, thank thanks you, to everybody. All, all the thank staff you. that contributed. Yeah, appreciate all of your time and your input. And uh, this will be, as I said, this will be kind of phase one, and, and we will be back before you in the future. And as I said also, uh, we're hoping to have many of these trails done this summer and least phase one of the trails. So we'll keep you posted and 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 watch on social media and, and other media sources for updates on that. So thank you very much. What what's the schedule for the solar? Uh the solar is um is going to be back on track. They just uh, move forward on a next step with the conservation commission. Um so you will see a lot we will see uh if you're out on Hickory on the informal trails today and in the weeks and months ahead, you'll see uh, the solar project get back on track. Uh, they'll begin to clear the trees, which were felled some months ago, uh, improve the road, the bridge access, and then they'll get going with the construction itself. So summer 24 is gonna be a very busy summer at Hickory Ridge. You'll see a lot of activity. So we're gonna to have to manage the public. That will be one of our challenges is keeping everybody safe and also keeping some of the rare wildlife that makes its home out in Hickory safe as well. So um, a lot of traffic cops out there this summer making sure people and turtles and other wildlife in the stream and in the Fort River and on the land are, are kept safe. So, okay. Thank you Thank all. You very much. Okay, so the time now is 7.20. I guess we can go on to the next item on our agenda. Item four, University Drive Potential Housing Overlay District. So let's Nate see, I know the there were- for this one. What's that? I said Nate mm -hmm. is the, uh, the spokesperson for this one. Nate's the spokesperson, okay. So Nate, do you want to introduce it? 
Uh, I know you printed some comments we the different members of the board had made and such in the packet. Sure, thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. The um, Yeah, and there were some other comments. Um, Janet Keller had sent some in and uh, Susanna Mosprat had, um, had sent some, I think, were forwarded. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I, you know, I think Bruce had um, provided a nice summary. We could walk through that in a minute. Um, you know, it's been a little while since we looked at this. Uh, you know, he had provided some ideas where we had some consensus and what needs to be worked on. You know, I think the, um, and the geographic boundaries is another one. I think, you know, after the last time we spoke about this in person, you know, my thoughts are that we would consider this maybe like a housing and economic development overlay. And so, you know, kind of starting with kind of the bigger purpose, it seemed like a lot of planning board members wanted to also try to keep ground floor or, you know, a, a significant amount of space for non-residential use, as we call it, in our mixed-use building standard. And so, you know, I think, you know, just hearing that, uh, you know, my thought would be that, you know, the title of the overlay would kind of convey that, and then the purpose and goals of it would also have that. So, you know, you know, to me, that's where the planning board seemed like it was heading, right? It's not like we're just going to um, kind of put apartments in here and really try to lose any, uh, any you know, commercial retail or other space. And so, um, you know, I think that's something that we could discuss in terms of the purpose uh, and then also kind of the types of housing. Um, you know, I, uh, you know, in Doug's comments, there was some concern and some, you know, and some of the others about the size and scale of the buildings, the massing, uh, what the streetscape looks like. And so, you know, I think that's also part of the discussion. Uh, it, it kind of, to me, it's, you know, I just want to make sure we work down to that level first. Uh, so, you know, I, what I, what I like to see is that that, you know, service drive on the west side, like I said, becomes a pedestrian corridor. We keep the street trees and the setbacks respond to the conditions uh, along University Drive and then Amity and whatever, you know, what other streets may be involved. And so that the west side setback might be, you know, 15 or 20 feet, whatever it takes to have that, you know, the street trees in the corridor. And then on the east side, it might be a different setback. And so... Um, you know, it's it's really going to be something where, um, you know, it, it, the dimensional standards or certain things might be um, kind of qualified based on their location in the in the um, overlay. So it could be that you know the east side has some things that are different than the west side, depending on you know setbacks or character of that. Um, um, you know, and so I think that's that that'll be important. Um, you know, I I will say that. Uh, um, you know, this is to try to encourage development down here. Uh, Susanna had mentioned in her letter that, you know, we could try to, you know, we'd always said we'd like to present this to UMass. I don't, you know, I don't think that this is like a, a one for one bargaining chip, but I think that, you know, the uh, UTAC had identified this area as a place for looking at redevelopment and some other areas close to campus. And you know, I think this is something that we could show them and say, you know, yeah, I don't think we can ink a partnership or an agreement, but, you know, I think we could encourage them. Um, I think looking at pedestrian access up to uh, the northern part of University Drive into the, into campus is important, biking. Uh, and so, you know, my thought is if this becomes an area where there is some development and, you know, we can really work on that connection to, to the university. Um, yeah, and so I don't, I don't know if we would want to, if we want to just take comments from the board, Doug, or if you want to, I could pull up a map or something, um, you know, spend a little well, bit. Well, um, you know, I, I, the comments that I sent to you and Chris were really intended to sort of help inform you as you drafted something more, right. uh, more definitive for the board to react to. So I guess my first question is, is that a realist, realistic expectation on my part that that you would have time to to in fact draft something uh, yeah or, or are we going to be relying on one or more board members to essentially go away and do something and then come back yeah i mean i think that after this meeting we would we can start putting more you know pen to paper i think yeah i feel like there hasn't been enough of a consensus you know, I guess kind of around the purpose and goals and other things to really start doing that. You know, I feel like in general, the board seemed like 
yeah, this is a place for redevelopment, but really what is, what is the goal goals of that? You know, um, you know, is there certain styles of housing or types of housing or density we're looking for? And so I think, yeah, I mean, I just, I mean, I think having that kind of conversation tonight will help us. Um, okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Great. So Janet, you've got your hand up. So I agree with Nate that we need to talk about it more and get sort of clear on the goals and the concepts and the different ideas. And then I, um, it might be good to go through Bruce's, um, you know, summary or compilation, and then maybe talk about next steps, um, which, you know, you know, putting pen to paper for what. And so I have some ideas of next steps that we could do, but it makes more sense to me to talk about it towards the end. Okay, Karen. Um, I talked about this whole project with uh, a relative that I was with over the holidays, who's a um, a planner in uh, Oregon, Eugene, Oregon, and I described University Drive and a lot of the potential. And uh, she alerted me. She said, first of all, um, I would be careful of take of making too many regulations, such as." requiring the first floor or the ground floor to be retail and commercial. She said, unless you're ready to have a lot of empty spaces, because in her experience, she said, and we've seen that, um, that is just a hard sell right now. Uh, and if you leave it open, it's much better. So, so she said, what you wanna do is leave this to the designers to make a streetscape that's very welcoming and open. Uh, and attractive and kind of let the the market determine what what really goes in there. For example, it's much better to have maybe a, a, a dentist or a real estate broker or someone with an office uh, use it that might not qualify for something. So to be careful about the regulations. And then the other thing that she said is, so why are you limiting it to, um, did we say, we're, we're, we, we've been talking about five, potentially five stories. She, and I said, well, that's kind of uh, an aesthetic thing, but she said, this is also something that uh, the market would, um, should play a role in. So they were just things that kind of opened my mind to what we were discussing, our, our, all of our requirements. We should really be careful, I think, in what we do. And um, yeah, I, I agree, let's go through what we have consensus of and um, and go from there. Okay. All right. Uh, anybody else want to make any comments before we walk through Bruce's uh, document from December 4th, I believe? Okay. Nate, do you want to take the lead or? Sure, yeah. Uh, let me just, I'll just have to share my screen. You know, a good story about Eugene, Oregon, like year, this is years ago uh, when I was in high school, we were looking, I was looking at driving across country and a friend who had done it years before in his atlas, you know, circled different places. And in Eugene, he highlighted and he said, really good pot. <laughs> <laughs> My mom was like, oh, oh, OK. I'm like, I guess, you know, that's what, that's what he was. He highlighted every place across the country that had <laughs> good marijuana. Um, this is pretty funny. Is that visible for everyone? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, Karen, I think someone else, well, I think the number of stories is really important. I just wanted to say, um, you know, I had said less than five. <laughs> you said more than five. Some people have said five. And so I think that goes to the density. And so, um, you know, here's um, Bruce's uh, sheet, and it seemed like consensus was five stories. But I think that's maybe something we would revisit. I. I um yeah I, I don't you know I don't know I, I when I drive around and I look at what is five stories now it's a pretty tall building and so I think that's something we could discuss um and I can all you know this is a word document so I could type as we need to so I mean number one is a preference for mixed use you know specifically requiring commercial retail on the first floor and so we don't have a um. You know, it's not, you know, I don't know if it's like all of the first floor or it's only mixed use. You know, at one point we had said, could a 
mixed use buildings be site plan review and apartments be special permit. So it kind of incentivizes mixed use. I think in Amherst, the market is so heavily weighted to housing that if we said, you know, we'll let the market decide, I think we would see just a lot of apartments and not a lot of um, anything else. So it's, I understand what you're, you know, what, what you're saying. It's just, it's hard to, um, you know, to me, the mar the market's a little different, unique in each spot. I, I think it'd be hard to say, oh, let's just figure it out. I, I don't, I'm not sure we'd see a lot of mixed use otherwise. I think some developers might, right? I think some might, some owners might, but others might not. Yeah. I know in my comments, I'd said maybe just limit it to 30 foot, 30 feet depth from the front facade. Um, but I see four sets of hands here. So why don't we, that looks like a lot of comment on this. Karen, you're first. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I left my hand up. Okay, Janet. So I, you know, I sort of envision this as four stories. Um, I think five stories get kind of, we just kind of lose the vibe of Amherst and the, you know, the buildings that are most disliked in town are these kind of very big, bulky five-story buildings. Um, and, you know, so, you know, I, and I, in my mind, I thought if there's a fifth story, there has to be some extra benefit, right? So there has to be something, maybe we require them to be condos to create more like owned housing, not just always rental housing. Maybe we require some community amenity um, on the first floor, like community space or build, you know, a park or some, you know, outside space that everybody can use. Um, and then I had this like, the this, you know, law school thing in my head of slippery slope. So when I saw, when I saw a hundred, units per apartment, I thought, well, if you're allowing it here, why wouldn't you allow it in other parts of town? If you have, if you, you know, say five stories on University Drive or six or seven or 10, why wouldn't it be everywhere else? And so I, I, I was very conscious of like, if we, I mean, I would stick with the mixed use building, which allows you to do as many units as you want. But the idea is, you know, you're sort of building a shopping living area. People can walk to stores, they can there's a park, they can get to UMass, which is our largest employer, they can jump on a bus to Northampton and go work there. So I think this idea of heights and you know the density is just a hot, really difficult issue in our town, which is kind of why later I'm gonna, I, my suggestion for next steps is like, let's take that to stakeholders and see, like we have a vision, we have questions about heights and density. Um, what do you guys think kind of thing? But I do think, you know, it's like, it does seem like, and you know, mixed use commercial could be a preschool on the first floor. Like I keep on thinking, I'm like, I'm obsessed with the North um, part of Mass Ave in Cambridge because I have been driving it for, I don't know how many years, 40 years now. And over time you see like, there's a beer store, there's, a, there's several preschools, there's an Indian clothes store, there's lots of different food stuff and they're all small, they're all very, you know, easy, they're not very big buildings usually, and people, you know, throng them and they seem to thrive. So I do think the heights issue is really tough. All right. And it needs to be sort of a community decision. So, all right. Thanks, Janet. Jesse. I mostly agree with what Janet said. A couple of comments and one question, really. Um, comment on the height. At one point, we had talked about five stories, but maybe requiring not five stories in the facade, like a setback after some number of stories as a possibility, so that it's not just a total five story front. Um, mm -hmm. I think I also agree with the last thing Nate said about if we let the market entirely decide, it would be largely apartments and not commercial. And to me, that's a not desirable because in 10 years, the market might be different. And then there's only apartments on the first floor. So I feel like if we don't try and encourage that now, it's not going to come back as mixed use without significant efforts at that point. Um, and is it better to be not empty? I'm not sure. I, and my question relates to the buildings in town. What was the requirement there? I mean, we talked in the past about how the protocol spot stayed empty for X number of years, how the, the other uh, was it Prudential who's in there is not really attractive commercial space. Um, but I don't know what the requirement was on those buildings. Maybe one of you can educate me on that. Was was that commercial 
space mandated by zoning? It was. Sharon's shaking her head. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know about Kendrick, but all, all of three of those buildings were classified as mixed use buildings. So there had to be some commercial space in them. Um, and I think the most recent building that's just getting finished is part was permitted under our current zoning, which required a something like 30% of the first floor area to be commercial or to be non-residential. Um, and I don't actually know about the previous two buildings, but Chris, you've got your hand up. Maybe you can remember uh, for one East Pleasant and Kendrick Place. Yeah, there wasn't any requirement. There was just um, some of the building needed to be non-residential. And so in some cases we ended up with very small um, spaces not not in those uh, buildings along North Pleasant Street or East Pleasant Street, but in other parts of town, we ended up with you know a space of 200 square feet being considered the mixed use. So um, now we have um, criteria in place. It is 30 percent of the first floor. Um, so that's you know any building that's coming forward now needs to adhere to that unless we change that for this overlay zoning district. Okay. And if I if I can make one last comment on that, sure. Yeah. Uh, and I think Nate mentioned this at the last time we spoke on this project was ways to encourage uh, potential for smaller commercial spaces. So, like you mentioned, acquiring doors every so often in the on the first floor and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I'm really in favor of that as well. Trying to not let it be one big commercial space. Yeah, maybe a door every thirty. Anyways, we can do that. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, yeah. First, Bruce, and then Johanna. Um, Doug, I uh, I initially put my hand up as uh, uh, Nate started reading this list and then commenting immediately, and then of course then everybody's hands went up, and and I I the reason that I wrote this was because I thought we could avoid having to have the whole bloody discussion all over again. <laughs> and so I was immediately quite frustrated because I thought that the thing would be to 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 what extent do we agree that these items are, are consensus? We could we could uh, we could take comments uh, uh, purely on the basis of whether we agree with them because the intent was to continue to discuss stuff that we hadn't got to previously. Uh, my fear was being that we'll just go through the items of apparent consensus, and by the time we get to nine o'clock, we'll be right back where we started from. So that was what I put my hand up. But uh, I guess I should ask: is, uh, is 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 my concern everybody else's concern? Because if it isn't, then my concern doesn't matter. Well, I I mean I can say that I hoped we'd get farther than this document tonight. Um, yeah. So sure, I mean you know I it felt like we were pretty much in consensus with the things that you talked about. Hmm. Well, then let me just say the one, the other thing that I th that that I could put my hand up for, if, if it wasn't to to uh, just to make sure we we were not uh, stepping into a rabbit hole we didn't want to step in, and so it seems like uh, it's a, it's not a rabbit hole and and, and it's okay. Uh, so therefore, continuing in the in the vein, um, I think it's worth mentioning again because it was mentioned last time. There's a there's a, there's, there's a reason for five stories. And it relates to our mass building code. And uh, uh, so this is not an arbitrary thing. Uh, the, the, uh, the first floors are typically built for a different use, which we've been talking about mandating, which would be a retail commercial or some kind of use. There will be a concrete slab separating that from the upper stories, which if you build then the cheaper wood frame construction, you can build, I think, three stories. and. Uh, and if you use sprinkler systems, then you can get the fourth above the first. That adds to five. There's a pretty sound logic that says not just that we like five, but that the way the building codes are structured, that's there's a strong economic driver to that uh, number in conjunction with a requirement for a commercial use on the first floor. Yeah, um, you, you let's keep that get, in mind. You get more stories out of your elevator. You and, do too. And you're not high enough that you're a, uh, a high-rise building, which has a new set of, of requirements. 
and uh, and if we do have five, as has been mentioned, the 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 uh, the, the, the top floor could be set back. Um, uh, Janet and I had a conversation uh, earlier in the day, I think, where we were uh, talking about uh, about what would be in the latter part you know, after after the stuff we haven't consensed on, which was in in return for offering the uh, owners of these uh, parcels uh, this kind of upzoning, which clearly increases the developable potential of their lots, which clearly is an economic benefit to them. What can we get back? Uh, and one of the things that we thought, or I thought, or Janet thought might be uh, uh, a clawback, claw that's not the word, but a, a quid pro quo was that the uh, that we might want to have a mix of uh, um, for sale units and rental units. Uh, it's possible that we could ask for that. And if we were to ask for that, then the stepping back the top floor might be a good way of doing that because uh, the step back would create open terrace space, which is probably going to create uh, a, a higher, particularly with elevators, a higher uh, cost, a uh, higher value apartment uh, or uh, residential uh, 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 product or products which would be more likely to perhaps be sold. So th this, this, this feels like there could be a, a synergy here uh, uh, around the, uh, the five stories and the uh, requirements, uh, the, the, a, design guideline, a, a design guideline type requirement that the upper story uh, in the interest of street escape uh, scale be set back and, as I said, uh, providing opportunities for another uh, requirement that we might ask as a quid pro quo for allowing uh, this upzoning. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Um, I mean, even, I mean, I guess we don't typically get into ownership and mixed mixed ownership in an apartment building. I mean, as a, as a consumer or as somebody who could buy a condo, I guess I'd be a little bit leery of, you know, being a tiny little percentage of a big apartment building that had predominantly one owner. Um, I guess it's also possible that that one owner could just buy all the condos and rent them out, <laughs> in which case you haven't solved your or advanced your objective. Yeah, I, I don't know whether that is an objective. I'm just saying that we, we in consideration of, of things that we want, and, mm -hmm. and it might be, the, the question was, is the town uh, threatened with an oversupply of, or a higher fraction of rental accommodations than it feels mm -hmm. uh, appropriate? That's a mm -hmm. question. I don't know the answer to that, but it's possibly a question that we should ask. And depending on the answer, we might be looking for ways in which we can stimulate um, ownership, uh, 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 condominium type ownerships in, in uh, these structures. Right. Um, that's all. Okay. All right. And and I assume one of the objectives is to build more housing in town. <laughs> oh, yes. That's pretty clearly the objective. Okay. Janet. So, you know, the two items on, on this list, I agree with, with Bruce in terms of, I agree with almost all of them. <laughs> we hash it. Um, except that the two items were me were a question of heights. And if, you know, if it's like, you know, so... Do we, do we want to be there at high or do we want to be higher? The other one that really, I think I'd love to pull off the consensus list and it could be a separate thing is the parking. Like I would not move into a building where there was a half parking space for me. And so if you want to encourage working people that don't work at UMass or family housing and there's not enough places to park a car and I don't know anybody, I know, you know, very few people who don't, who have families who don't have cars and often multiple cars. So I think, I don't feel like the parking necessarily has to be at the building, but there has to be parking, enough parking in the area, not just for commercial use, but also for people to use. And so I think, you know, if we could pull the, like how much parking is needed, maybe off the consensus list. And this is actually something we could talk to UMass about is, you know, maybe they have space for parking, you know, during the, during, you know, like down by their, um, what do you call it, their stadium, which is almost always empty, you know, or maybe they, you know, they would be their, you know, plans for a parking lot if they're planning to develop University Drive 
um, we might say to a developer, you don't have to put parking on site, but you have to contribute to a, like a municipal parking fund. And we'll, you know, for building a parking garage in that area, maybe there's a deal to cut with Big Y, who is not using your spaces at night. But I do think that, you know, half a um, car per apartment, which could be two or three bedroom, is going to knock out most families. And so if we're trying to find housing where people could rent or buy and live, I think we just have to accept that there's at least one car per household. Um, maybe they don't always have to use it, but I, I find it really difficult to believe that many families can really function in the valley unless they just want to live along a bus line and, you know, their doctors and hospital and everything has to be there. Okay. Well, this is a minimum. So, you know, the developer could recognize that people need more parking and, and propose some too. Karen. Um, yeah, basically, I agree uh, with Bruce and Janet on this too. And I didn't want to necessarily um, start all over again. I, I, I do like the idea of mixed use. I like the idea of encouraging housing for uh, multiple um, kind of constituents, students, as well as as um, Susanna Muskrat said in her letter, um, there's a real need for people that want to live here to be able to um, to perhaps buy. I I this is new to me, but you know, um, I actually. We we have an apartment in Berlin, which is exactly like that. It's it's owned by people, but the ground floor is commercial, and just about the whole city where the commercial things are are that way. The apartments above them are not just rental; they're they're owned, and it makes for an incentive of having really a mixed uh, group of people that live there. So, and and the fact that you would then maybe have it be a place which has a kind of open terrace in the front would also perhaps from a design point of view uh, really help to make this an attractive thing. I So yes, I didn't want to revisit that, but I thought uh, it was, was certainly worth zeroing in that the height thing is very important. Okay, thanks, Karen. Nate? Yeah, um, you know, and I think it's important to talk about some of these. I agree. I was hoping to move a little bit um, along, you know, and I was going to mention in terms of parking. I mean, ideally, I would have no parking requirement here. And you let the developer decide if whatever they want to, you know, there, someone's a developer is not going to build a hundred unit building and have no parking if they think their tenants want parking or the occupants want parking. And so, you know, to me, this minimum is, you know, a nod to having some parking, but ideally, it'd be no, I'd have no requirement. Um, I think, you know, again, going back to the market in Amherst, <clears throat> you know, does that mean then it becomes, you know, students because they don't have cars. And so, you know, there's different ways to try to back, you know, back into this, but, um, you know, we have other requirements we could have other requirements in terms of open space or amenities or, you know, certain things. And so, um, you know, I think as a minimum requirement, I think it's fine. I mean, often now in the zoning, we allow for a waiver if, you know, if an applicant can justify it. Um, I mean, I, so I could go down this list. I do think, you know, mixed use is important. I guess the question really is how much do we require, of, you know, for that? You know, and is that something we go beyond? You know, we can go to the next level here. So we agree mixed use is important. We, you know, we want to build some taller buildings and then, you know, really, which we can start to look at as say items down, down here, because, um, you know, I will say that for this part of town, um, whether or not it's three or five or six stories, whatever it is, I think there's some ability to have density here, uh, and have it work. I think we have a pretty wide streetscape. We can have some wide setbacks and I think height can be, can be managed here. Um, you know, more strategically than in other parts of town or other village centers. And so, you know, if we are really talking about trying to have housing opportunity, you know, this area has been identified by a few different studies as a place where we could have quite a bit of density. And so I, I you know, I wouldn't want to miss that opportunity um, with the thought that other parts of town then could be examined for, you know, different types of housing. And so, you know, it's a, this is one piece in a larger kind of solution Okay, 
Thanks, thanks, Nate. Karen, your hand is still up. No. So I was gonna just jump in. Sorry, items to for consensus. I think the boundary is one we could talk about. You know, here, here, you know, I just asked that. Uh, you know, specific fraction of the first floor designated as commercial or retail, a cap or no cap on the number of apartment units, uh, and then you know some subsidy or something for um, to incentivize uh, non-residential space. And in the packet, I had shown a new boundary eliminating the property north of Amity. There's just one. It was originally included because it is actually zone BL. So it's a, uh, you know, just to be consistent with that. And then I, you know, I removed Hawkins Meadow and the, um, and uh, the auto repair shop, but I kept in the properties around the intersection. And so, you know, I think, I think that is something we can continue to discuss is the, um, the boundary. Yeah, that looks, looks, Looks like it reflects some of the comments from last time. Right. Um, and then uh, we've, well, I mean, I had a comment that I mentioned earlier about the fraction of the first floor. Um, you know, I, I proposed a cap on the number of apartment units just to try to keep the buildings from getting too big and uh, to try to have multiple buildings that probably you know, we'll give you a variety of, of facade treatments and materials so that you, you know, you don't end up with some of those really long facades like some of the images that you showed for us last fall. Um, and then I'm not quite sure I understand your rental subsidy. Uh, you know, I mean, it seemed like if one developer builds the building and it's got commercial space on the first floor and they know it's going to be vacant for a while or that it's that the market won't pay them the full cost of building it the subsidy is going to be kind of built into their economic models kind of what I'm what I assume and so I'm not quite sure how something else would work Nate I actually don't understand number four like uh, Janet why don't you uh Raise your hand. Bruce Sorry. is next. Sorry. Yeah, I was going to defer to Bruce. I think, you know, um, the planning board I talked about, you know, are there ways to, um, you know, have, say, smaller commercial spaces as opposed to if we were have if we require a, a percentage, would someone just have a huge, you know, vacuous space that they don't really care about filling exactly as you said, Doug, because they're subsidizing it through the residential component. And so, you know, are there ways to um, and try to encourage different types of you know, first floor use. And so, you know, I, I know I, I haven't, I, I'll say I haven't researched this a lot. Um, you know, I've looked at it a little bit. I think it's really difficult, uh, but I think that's really what this is talking about is how do we, you know, try to get the spaces we might want. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, hey, Bruce, you're next. Uh, yes. I, uh, I put this in because I think I say that numbers may have, uh, I realized at the time that it was difficult to imagine how this would work. And of course, one of the reasons why it isn't in the consensus bunch is because it wasn't uh, broadly supported or perhaps even understood. But I think I agree with you, Doug, and uh, uh, that, uh, that this is uh, something that uh, would be too difficult to uh, uh, put into any regulatory language. Um, so we should, and as you said, it uh, may well be uh, taken care of by the marketplace anyway. So, well, well I, you could, you could, you could try to guide the architecture and require a, a public entry door every, you know, twenty-five or thirty feet, so that they can come back and subdivide when they finally get desperate enough to split it up and have uh, small small uh, enterprises yes space well that's a better way of saying it the 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 the, the number four as it stands here talks about um, requiring some form of rental subsidies that's the part that I I think yeah. uh, uh, our our regulatory structures are too blunt to be able to do that and I think if we try uh, 
uh, the bluntness turns into it will be unwieldy. And I, so I would uh, suggest that we um, don't pursue this or don't try and pursue this other than the, what Nate has been uh, typing below about the uh, making sure it's possible to subdivide the uh, 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 the um, the ground floor structures. That's okay. a good idea, I think. All right, thanks, Bruce. Janet, you're on. I think I understand number four a little better. I would, in terms of the overlay boundary, I wouldn't take any residential homes. And so, um, you know, university, the new university drive south, part of it extends into um, what is now a commercial and a mixed use building. So that makes sense to include it, although I, I don't think they're going to want to redevelop it to hire. I wouldn't go across the street and take those homes. I think, you know, we should just leave the RN alone and just focus on, you know, the bulk of the thing. I just, you know, I think, you know, pushing out the commercial is going to be upsetting to people living along that street. I'm sure they all want to come and shop there, but I'm not sure that they're going to want to see their homes taken over or, you know, people along Snell Street will be, you know, you know, they've already, they, they're next to a quiet veterinary, they're next to University Drive South, they can get their eyes checked, they can walk across the street if they're lucky and go shop, but I don't think they want to see that all come at them. And maybe they do, and if we do some stakeholder meetings, we'll, people will be crying for that, but I just think let's leave the RN alone and not take any residential houses and really just focus on these open lots. The other um, suggestion I have, if we go back to that list of, I lost my list on my desk, is um, just two pieces of information. When we pick the 30% for of mixed use um, for commercial space on the first floor for mixed use, that was the lowest percentage of any town that we looked at. And so we should think maybe it could be bigger. And then um, I think, I can't remember who rejected this. I can't remember if it was town council or CRC or the pl old planning board. I think it was the town council. They didn't want to allow apartment buildings in the downtown because they were afraid that people would just build apartments and we'd lose lose that kind of commercial retail um, kind of lively street um, and shopping. So I, I don't, I think, that, you know, we should just stay with mixed use. It can let you put as many units as you want in the building, but we need to keep that kind of vital, you know, kind of urbanish feeling or you know this is a street that you can do a lot of things at so I, I would say just skip no apartment buildings allowed and then if you do and you're allowing 100 units there's a cap on everywhere else in town of 24 units and so again I think people were saying well why can't we do that here and anyway that's it all right it's a lot um I guess I, I I'll just say I I disagree with you about the parcels south of Route 9. And, um, you know, in terms of consistency with other parts of town, we can be inconsistent between different parts of town. It's not, you know, they're geographically different. They have different roadway systems. They're in different proximities. So I wouldn't be uh, constrained by that. Uh, Jesse and then Nate. Thanks. Um, two different topics. One, Janet touched on on the boundary, and you just commented on also, Doug. I think I agree more with Janet that I don't see the need right now to include the the residential houses that are there already. Um, I think the the boundary is pretty clean, just on the north side of uh, Northampton Road. Uh, I did want to comment on the commercial use. Can we go back to that list? Can you back up one night to the to the text? So, so I, I totally appreciate what uh, Bruce was saying about the difficulty in trying to encourage different types of commercial space. But I think anything we think could work, we should do. I'm very much in favor of, of really encouraging that mixed use first floor. Um, and I'm thinking more about 10 years from now when the demographic might be different according to all analyses than in three or three to five years when they get filled, assuming these get built. Okay. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, Nate. Yeah. Um, sorry, I was just typing. I think the, um, I was gonna go back again. The, uh, you know, the residential pieces, I think this is where, uh, you know, tailoring setbacks, 
or dimensional standards to different pieces of the overlay could work. So if we're, you know, if we want to keep a buffer here, you know, we could have different side or rear setbacks and really encourage development along the street and on the corner here. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's the thought, um, you know, to include these, it really creates an anchor point on this corner. And so, you know, I, I think it would be, could be a missed opportunity. Uh, you know, there is wetlands and possible some other things here. So there could be limited development, but really, you know, we could have some setbacks or dimensional standards to encourage development along the street there. Um, and then in terms of, yeah, the apartments, I think, Doug, you know, you uh, capping the number of units to me is, is tricky because you could have, you know, an apartment building with a hundred studios or an apartment building with, you know, three and four bedroom units. And so the, the number of beds or the actual, you know, the occupancy is drastically different and it, you know, you had mentioned it. And I think we could say it that if we're really, if we want to regulate facade length, maybe we just say it that, you know, a facade over 80 feet in length needs to have a step back of 10 or 15 feet or a, a break in something and that has to be clear to the sky or have a, you know, some, I think there's probably ways we could, we could, okay. um, you know, do that. I, you know, I think that trying to cap units is really interesting. I feel like they're, you know, the market changes. So the cap, you know, it's really the number of beds can, can vary. Um, but I understand what you're saying. I don't, no one liked the stores images where, you know, it was just a, a wall of five stories and, you know, you could tell that it was really all maybe, uh, you know, concurrent development and there wasn't really uh, any, any relief in the architecture. And so, you know, it is different when you have one building with some open space and then another building in it, you know, as opposed to, a, you know, something that is just really reads as, as a, as a wall. And so, yeah. um, you know, and I, yeah, and I think, you know, we're working with Dodson and Flinker, hopefully that will become a little bit more active um, in February, you know, we're asking them to look at things like that. Uh, you know, I think we could have a few of the kind of standards here if this were to move uh, faster and then apply what, what they uh, come up with, you know, here as well. And so, um, but I, I, yeah, I mean, I don't want to put this out there and have, you know, some way that we're, you know, we're, we're missing something like oh, all of a sudden we have a 200 foot long building. That's just really massive. Right. Okay. Johanna. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm really appreciating tonight's discussion. Um, and I had a couple of thoughts. The first is that we likely won't get to consensus on all these provisions. And so um, there's part of me that is interested in starting to figure out what are the things that the majority of us agree on. And maybe it makes sense to chunk it out. And let's see if we can, you know, get to a larger proposal. Um, and then, you know, we'll have an up or down vote on that. Um, and then on, and I think most of the, I think um, I appreciated what Bruce put together as like proposed consensus things. I think there are still some things there that probably need to move back into the discussion topic. Um, but on one of the things that's currently in the discussion topic I wanted to address was the boundary. And I spoke to this in our last meeting, um, but the way I see it, coming back to our overall goal, we want to add housing and increase vitality in this part of town. And the smaller we make it, the fewer opportunities we create to do that. And so I would be interested in keeping the scope of like opportunity bigger. I see intersections as really like important nodes. And when I look at um, in particular, the properties that are kind of closest to town, there are, I believe, two, and this, I'm, I'm talking about Route 9. Um, Nate, I don't know if you can bring up the map, but there are, there are two houses. They're not in great shape. Um, and then there's a property right next to the bike path. And to me, that's just like, I just see tremendous opportunities to accomplish our goals of creating more housing and doing it in a way that minimizes driving by leveraging the bike path. And I would just 
I, I just think it's a shame if we leave that on the table. Uh, Johanna, are those properties within the boundary now or outside of it? As drawn, they're in the boundary. So they're those um, on the lower bot part of the drawing, the two purple uh, okay. boundaries right by Snell and University. Yeah, so she's talking about um, these three right here. Yeah. That's visible. Okay, good. Thanks. All right. Yeah, I was also thinking at it, you know, there may be questions like the boundary that we should just have a straw, straw poll on right now and see where people are at. And then Nate knows how to proceed. Um, Doug? Janet, me? you're next. No, um, Bruce has dropped out of the meeting and can't get back in. He just called me. Oh, so I, okay. I just missed. I'm sorry, Johanna. I missed what you said. So um, there he is. Looks like he's coming back. Is he coming back? He said he, he tried all the links and it didn't work. Here he is. Okay, I'm back. I don't know what happened, but I haven't been here for 10 minutes. Oh, oh sure. no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, don't worry. Let's, I'm back. We'll forget well, about I it. Guess, from... I guess you can watch the video. <laughs> I could. <laughs> well, let's see. The, the time is uh, 10 after 8. So if you start watching about 90 minutes in, that's be about the point where you cut out. All right. Um, let's see. I see three more hands here. Uh, it is 10, almost 10 after 8. So if we want to take a break, we can do that uh, whenever people are ready. I, I realize Bruce just took a break. So, um, or Jesse, you are next. Thanks. Just one more thought about this boundary and that corner spot. And Nate, I, I totally appreciate what Nate said about its possibility for sort of gateway entering Amherst. And I think that's actually the objection I'm having. So when I think about town currently, and if you drive up the hill at to enter Amherst at the main intersection versus entering Amherst from the north or from UMass, it's a very different experience right now because of the newer buildings coming in from UMass versus coming in from Northampton Road. And I would like to keep the character of coming in from Northampton Road, meaning it's a lower scale, smaller town, the way the planning board and the town has kept the town until these bigger buildings. And I would not be in favor of having, okay, you enter Amherst, and then we have on every corner a Kendrick Place type building as what your first impression of town is. And I kind of like that this potential new zone is, is not a direct required experience as you come into town. It's sort of tucked away off Northampton Road and you're going there with intention. So I just wanted to share that, that thought on, on that boundary question. Okay, thanks, Jesse. Um, Janet and then Chris. So Jesse, I'm glad you said that because when I drive through Hadley and Route 9, I find it unbelievably depressing. Um, and it's just all this strip development. It reminds me of everything I left behind in Long Island. Um, and then when I hit that intersection and go up the hill, I start feeling good. And I, you know, and I, it's like, it's just, you, you hit, you're, you're back in New England. It's a beautiful town. And it just, that's where I start to enjoy you know, getting off or, or that part I enjoy Route 9. So I do think it's kind of, you know, to fill that up with other development is just extending that kind of strip zone. Um, I would love to think it's it's a beautiful new building going in. I just haven't seen much of that that is appealing to me. So I, I would like to keep that feeling. I think it's it says like you're in Amherst, even though you kind of have been in Amherst for a while. The other thing I worry about in that intersection is is traffic. That's like a really crummy intersection to make a left-hand turn. Like if you're ever gonna put in a very small rotary, that would be it. And I think that putting, you know, people pulling in and out on the other side of the road and then people pulling into the the, the medical area, it's just gonna become another area of congestion, congestion and cars pulling in and out at every spot, which when you're on Route 9, you really have enough of, you know, enough of that. And so I, I would say just leave that there for now 
maybe add it later if you had some great design standards and the buildings you know get you a feeling like oh we're in new england again not in some strip development in anywhere usa all right thanks janet chris i was um strangely enough going to say exactly what jesse and janet just said i really appreciate driving along route nine coming to that intersection and then driving up the hill and having it be a starkly different experience. Um, you know, whatever happens to those little houses, I don't know in the future, but I think it's really, um, it's a lovely way of entering Amherst, even though those buildings aren't all kept up as well as they could be. And, you know, providing um, a place where you can have density in five-story buildings along University Drive, I think is a great idea, but trying to at least, you know, for the next, little while preserving that entry into Amherst is really something that a lot of people appreciate. That's okay. all. All right. Thanks, Chris. Um, not seeing any more hands at the moment. Uh, shall we take a five minute break? Seeing a few heads nod. Okay. Uh, so the time at least on my clock is 8.12. Yeah, let's come back at 8.17. Please mute and turn off your camera while you're away.
All right, my clock says 817. If anybody's behind the black screens wants to turn their camera back on. All right, we still need Fred and Nate. Lost Bruce. I'm here. I'm just eating my ice cream. How about you, Mother? Well, I'm okay. listening. <laughs> All right, yeah, stop, ma stop making me hungry <laughs> for ice cream. I'll show my screen, Doug, just so that Nate doesn't think uh, you're waiting for me rather than him. And then I'll 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 go back to eating my ice cream when Nate arrives. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Well, I would like to wait for Nate to come back. Chris, would it make sense for us to tick off a couple of our later agenda items before Nate comes back? You are muted. Sorry, I said sure that he may be dealing with some family thing. Okay. Well, could we Sorry. defer those to next week? Because we're going to meet again in a week, right? Yes, we are. Yeah, that's true. Well, it shouldn't take long. I mean, True. You know, do we have any old business that's not reasonably anticipated? No old business. No old business. 
Do we have any new business that's not anticipated? No new business. Do we have any Form A, A and R subdivision applications? No. No. So how looking about, good. about ZBA applications. I have nothing new to share. Okay. Any SPP, SPR, and SUB applications? There are things coming in, but we haven't received them yet. So we don't like to talk about them until we actually receive them. Right. Okay. All right. But I will tell you that the town council is going to be um, going back and looking at Amherst Hills. So this is in the, a matter of a subdivision. Amherst Hills has finally been finished um, and they are coming to have the town um, accept their roads. And so um, town council will be considering that on Monday night. And we believe that town council will be referring that um, acceptance to the planning board, which has a role in accepting roadways. So the planning board will be needing to talk about this at one of its upcoming meetings. And um, you have 45 days from the referral to make a recommendation to town council as to whether you think that the roadways should be accepted or not. And um, so just wanted to make that announcement. Um, we also have a request from um, the Meadows, from the residents of the Meadows, but that is not in as clear um, a situation. So there will be more to be said about that, but for, for now, I think Amherst Hills is in good okay. shape. Okay. All right. Great. So we ticked off oh, maybe five items there. Um, Nate, welcome back. We, we jumped ahead and just went through a few of this, the routine items in our agenda while you were away. So, um, so uh, do you want to bring up uh, or should we bring up Bruce's list again or you know, I mean, we haven't even gotten to the items that were yet to be discussed. Um, I know I threw out some dimensions and things in my email to you, uh, but we really haven't had a conversation about most of them. Yeah, I mean, I guess we could talk about the boundary, I think, a little bit more. It sounds like there's some discussion there. You know, I think the map was hard to read. I was just going to mention that those residential properties are in the RN zoning district. And, um, you know, I think at, I mean, I, I agree that there is some uh, point where Route 9 transitions, it's, it seems like at that intersection where it becomes more residential or different scale and character as you're coming up the hill. Um, you know, is it is it okay, though, that that corner could be something different? Or, you know, if this was part of the overlay, you know, we could incentivize, say, townhouses or something other than apartments, right? Something that's not, say, allowed an RN at some density. And so it could be that, you know, we get kind of specific in this area and we, you know, we could do something, we could, you know, we could, I don't want to say we can do whatever we want, but we could, you know, try to incentivize things here that instead of a five-story building, um, right, we could have like a sub area of this overlay. So um, but I think that's, you know, I, I think the boundary is important. Uh, I had the property map pulled up. You know, the other area is now one university drive south. Uh, so, you know, it's in the PRP zone. I mean, is it worth it to keep it in the overlay? It's already been recently developed. There's the five college realtors uh, across the street. That's, you know, it's in a residential building, but it's used as an office space. And then there's, you know, the uh, ginger garden there. So, you know, I, I think the zoning... I will say that the zoning we're trying to, you know, with, you know, with the zoning, we're providing opportunity for things to happen. It's not as if it, you know, we're not requiring it. So I do think that if say this were an overlay, I do think that some of the property owners would redevelop. You know, I think that there's been, you know, since this discussion has started a few months ago, some property owners have asked the town and I think there would be some interest, you know, that might be a few properties that could be, you know, three or four properties, um, uh, and it could be a start, but it, you know, it doesn't mean that it'll happen, um, you know, right away. Uh, and so, you know, I think for the boundary, 
we could always change it, but I, I think that is a point where I'd like to just you know try to work on because I think that if we if we are, if we feel comfortable with the boundary and kind of the purpose, you know, I was typing notes up top saying you know expand housing opportunity, you know, a live work um, shopping area, um, you know, encourage mixed uses. You know, if those are kind of some broader goals, and then you know if we can say okay, here's the area we want that to happen in, and then we can start going down Doug on that list. And so I don't know if we. I can pull up the map again and well, well, do you want to just get a straw poll on whether to go south of the of Route Nine or not? Yeah, I think that would be a good one. All right, all right. Um, so, I guess um, I do see Janet and Karen's hands. Uh, are your comments concerning this boundary issue? So, Karen, you're saying yes. So, go ahead and say something. Uh, I just have a question. Is it, I mean, this is something that could, I, I so agree with Jesse and Janet in uh, where we want to encourage, you know, vitality, but we also are trying to preserve the character of our town and the approach to our town. And I'm just wondering, this boundary does, if, if we leave that out, that corner uh, is, is that not something we can come back to easily? I mean, wouldn't it be just safer to just not do that now and and wait and, and develop that later? Well, I think the answer is sure, we can come back later. Um, you know, for any of this to happen, it would need to go through town council and probably CRC. And uh, so it's not a completely simple thing to have any of this happen. And the more times we chip away at it, uh, you know, just the more time it takes on 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 other meeting agendas. And so I just, okay. yeah, I was gonna, so I was gonna, you know, if we, um, you know, we eliminate everything uh, south of Route Nine, I guess the question will, sorry, um, I don't know if you can hear the dog barking or the other. Here's five college realtors right here, and so do we, you know, eliminate something along here. And so I think, you know, I, to me, that would be two parts, south of the Route 9 and also this area. OK. All right, so why don't I just start by saying, by asking about south of Route 9. Um, so maybe let's use our raise hand functions here. Uh, members of the board, if you are in favor of the Boundary extending south of Route 9, please raise your hand. OK, so it looks like we have only two members who are in favor of that, Nate. So we probably have five who are opposed to that. OK, we can put our hands down. Doug, if I may interrupt, uh, I wouldn't have put my hand up for either option because I don't feel strongly either way. OK. Um, OK, so then how many members would support including the area that Nate has outlined in blue that's north of Route 9 with the uh, real estate office and maybe one other property? So if you are in favor of including that, please raise your hand. All right, so that's one, two, three, four members, five members in favor, and one member, two, two members opposed. All right, thank you. We can put our hands down. All right, Nate, so that gives you some feedback. It looks like uh, there's very weak support for going south of Route 9, and there's pretty substantial report, support for, go, for going all the way to Route 9. All right, um, Nate, are there other straw polls we need to take yet? You are, yeah, there. Yeah, I think the um, number two here, the kind of 
fraction of first floor commercial. And I think, I think the discussion could be, yeah. I'm, so, you know, at one point we talked about would could we allow apartments without a cap on units here and make those special permit, have uh, mixed use buildings be a site plan or a view. I mean, heck, if we have some design standards, are they just by right? No, I know that's too radical, but- um, Oh, come on, know, this is our chance to be radical. This is our chance, uh, you know, um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I feel like if we if we really worked on this and we said, okay, this is where we want this, could we have a buy right use like a mixed use building? Because if we have some pres prescriptive standards and dimensional standards, it's like you know what? How much do we need? Why why would we need too much uh, review? But um, I think for now, if we're focusing on number two, is really about the kind of requirement of first floor or non residential space in a building. I think that's really important. I um. You know, I agree with Janet that when we proposed the 30%, a lot of other communities had 50% or 100% on the ground floor, you know, the, the whole facade facing the street. You know, I, I think it's a difficult thing to um, to know what's right, uh, you know, and markets change and uses change. Uh, I think that, you know, as met, people mentioned that if people design apartment buildings, they probably wouldn't do a podium build. And so you lose that ability to convert it though in the future. And so um, I think having some requirement uh, is a good thing. I just don't know, you know, what that is. Mm -hmm. um, and I will say just quickly, you know, I was talking to another planner and he said, you know, look at Greenfield, right? They've done a lot of investment in public buildings, courthouse, you know, the YMCA library, uh, they're putting a fire station, uh, you know, Wilson's might be changing, but, you know, there's a lot of kind of underutilized storefronts in downtown there. And they've been trying for years with the bank and different things. And we were just, right, we we're trying to talk about what, you know, what is the answer there, right? Is it, you know, how could, you know, they have a lot of building there. Could How come that could become like a retail ground floor Mecca, right? I mean, there's parking, it's walkable. And, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it's just, you know, is there ways, as we've talked about, to incentivize it? Um so yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I I don't really have the an answer, but I I, I like the idea of having requiring mixed use buildings, and I think this should, could be something that we discuss a little bit more. Okay. Do you want to have some conversation about it now? Okay. Yeah, I think that'd be good. I mean, you know, okay. at one point I was saying have this overly be just apartments, and then you know yeah. I think I was persuaded that it can be other things, and so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I mean, I'll just say. I had thought if we required the architecture of the building to be configured for commercial use and retail on the first floor with a lot of glass, frequent entries, uh, strong horizontal uh, at the top of the first floor between the first and second floors with, uh, you know, that can serve as a sign band or as a place for awnings. Uh, then you've built in the architecture so that the building can function for retail and commercial behind it. Uh, and then, you know, even if even if the you know the glass got papered over and used as a I don't know massage parlor um, because they don't want everybody watching the massages, at least the architecture is there so that it's flexible and it's commercial. You know, maybe somebody would blank out the glass and uh, put their apartment behind it or leave the glass open and, you know, just be on display. I don't know. But, um, you know, I, I thought the architecture was the place to start and make sure it was configured for, for a commercial retail use. And then... Um, some amount of the of that facade, if if we can require it to be commercial behind it, that would be great. You know, I I just picked thirty feet as a sort of minimally vi viable depth, um, and I think that's better than doing a percentage because the, you know, the percentage the floor area is going to vary depending on the size of the building. So that was Doug's thoughts about it. Um, and I haven't seen any other hands go up yet. Are there other board members who wanted to comment on number two here? Jesse. Doug, have you, oh. I was just gonna say, Bruce and Janet both have their hand up. 
and oh, then I did? also oh I I my, I'm not seeing everybody okay thank you uh Janet so you know I've worked in Greenfield a bit and I think Greenfield's problem isn't a lack of desire and they have beautiful buildings is that they're not next to the world, the, the, the region's largest employer. And so UMass is the largest employer of Amherst in the region, and it's the largest employer of Northampton. And so, you know, this area is right next to North is right next to UMass. And, you know, even though it has those like funky little strange buildings, they're almost all filled um, with kind of small shops. And, you know, so I think is, it's definitely like a, if you build it, they will come. Um, you know, look at Hadley. They have built tiny building after tiny building. People have built buildings on spec. They've filled it with people who are doing dental work and this and that and the other thing. And so I think, and then Hadley itself has become a huge kind of shopping draw for the region with its big boxes. So, you know, and then, you know, I think we recently heard that the, you know, the bid that we had almost a very low vacancy rate in, you know, Amherst Center. And so I think that I think that we should be confident that something will come in. And we also know that the rental or the, the housing market is so strong that it could support those, you know, kind of spaces being empty for a little while. But I do think if we build it, they will fill up because they're so convenient to UMass and they're so convenient to, you know, all parts of town as well as Route 9. Um, and so I just think that, you know, there seems to be no end of small businesses moving into Hadley and, in, you know, what seem to be sort of, you know, little buildings that people wouldn't even want to go out of their way to go to, but there they are, you know. So I think we should be confident that if we build something that's really attractive, Zona really, like for attractive stuff, it will it will bring people in. All right. Thanks, Janet. Bruce. I agree with everything Jan said. All three of those points, uh, I think, are well made. Uh, but in addition, um, one of the earlier conversations we've had was that we really should, in, in pursuit of uh, a variety or, uh, of housing types, that uh, this was mentioned the last time we had this discussion, that it would be good to require or uh, somehow encourage um some housing to uh, touch the ground as well so that it can have outdoor space because uh, small family uh, families would prefer that. And whether that can be done or not, I'm not sure, but as a goal, yes, an aspiration, an ideal, a vision. Um, so some sport, some, so some uh, first floor space should be, I think, ideally that type of housing. So back to the fraction. So I think the, uh, 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 in agreeing with Janet uh, and, and with you, I think uh, the fraction should be high, I think more than 30%, although I know you were not supportive of percentages, but not 100%. So I would, I would think it, but it should be, it should be probably at least 50%. I mean, uh, the, 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 the bulk of the first floor area should be designated and should be uh, as expected to be used for the, uh, vitalizing uh, uh, activities associated with uh, retail, commercial, and community uh, uses. So uh, I think a, 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 higher, a, a higher than 50% uh, floor space, but not 100. Between, okay. I don't know, 50 and 75 are, are arbitrarily would be my sense of what might be ideal. Now, the other thing we could do, I suppose, as we do with parking, is that having made that declaration, we could uh, say that this ratio can be varied uh, at the discretion of the board for reasons uh, of, you know, and the same kind of uh, um, three uh, three words uh, that describe the basis on which we can vary parking. We could come up with three words or that describe why we could uh, it would be, it would be in in the interest of the town for us to uh, vary. Uh, or allow a variation of that uh, designated percentage. So that might give us the flexibility. Uh, but uh, certainly by declaring the percentage as the requirement, uh, we uh, express the intention. Okay. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, Jesse. Um, I'm thinking about if we can require it, the, the whole facade, but not the whole depth of the building. I would think that to me is a pretty logical way to go, which could also accomplish some of what Bruce was just bringing up about some apartments towards the rear touching outside space. 
Um, but it also, to me, ties back into the parking issue a little bit if we're going to try and encourage all this commercial activity. I think there also needs to be reasonable parking to accommodate that, not just from the people who are living there. Uh, but again, maybe the developers would recognize that and put in enough parking. I'm not sure how to handle that. Okay. All right, uh, Nate, there's some input. Yeah, I was going to say the, um, sorry if I could just jump in quickly. The, uh, you know, we had talked about that a while ago when we looked at the mixed use, the new, the current standards, as Bruce mentioned, like a, a waiver provision, but, you know, it's it's tricky because the developer would come in and say that they can't fill it, you know, or that it could change and it's early on in the process. And so, you know, to me, I'd want like a rigorous review, like, you know, a budget pro forma or reasons why, or, you know, like, you know, how, ha how have they actually tried to market that space or find a tenant? And so I feel like typically when they come to planning boards for site plan review, they might not even have tenants in mind other than they might have some ideas for general size of space or something. And so, I don't know, I find it would be, I, I feel like it would be hard to um, ask for a waiver unless we're asking for more information as to why they can or can't fill that space, uh, which, you know, might not be kind of in sequence for the, how the permitting typically goes. Right. Um, Chris, I, I'm going to call on you next. Yeah, so that waiver doesn't have to be granted at the time the building is built. It could be something that's flexible that could go on into the future. So when um, the owner of the building has a tenant that can fill, you know, 30% or 50% or whatever the requirement is, that's fine. But then over time, it may be that he can't fill that space and then he could come in for maybe it's a special permit to be allowed to reduce the amount of commercial space and turn that commercial space into residential space. So that, you know, I guess what I'm saying is it doesn't have to be decided at the, at the outset of the project. It can be decided later on when we know whether these spaces can be filled or not. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Bruce. Uh, I had my hand up to say something like that, but couldn't figure out how to say it. And I took my hand down. So thank you, Chris. That was great. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was going to say that in, in uh, the, uh, I think the words that we've used in the past are for compelling reasons. Um, so whatever, whatever the driver of the, uh, the granting of a waiver is for compelling reasons. So, uh, uh, and then reasons of whatever, but, but we have to have it, it would have to be uh, uh, compelling reasons. And I think the way Chris structured it is one way of, des uh, one way of uh, establishing a compelling reason but it's on the basis of uh, um, some recent history I think that's good I like that so you know that would say that the you have to build the building to the percentage that we are calling for and then say within or or not sooner than say I don't know two years five years uh the 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 owner could apply for a special permit to allow some of that space to be used for residential use is that um, kind of where we're headed i was thinking that, that to some degree yes but as we've seen with uh, some of the houses downtown um a, a, a wily uh developer could uh design it and build it uh analogous to the uh the construction of these apartments that have large bedrooms and no living space, which are clearly not intended for family. And then uh, when families don't come in because the design is not suited to them, you then go and ask for a, 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 a special, uh, some kind of a, a, a subsequent permission to not, a, not comply. So I, I can see how that, uh, that this could be, uh, this could be gamed, by wily developers, but uh, but on the other hand, I um, maybe we just have to try. Uh, to we're trying to get what we want, and we're trying to figure out ways in which we can achieve that. So I think the goal is laudable. Um, I'll shut up. <laughs> okay, Bruce. Uh, Karen, you're next. Um, I think the problem. We, we all were hoping 
that we wouldn't drive all the mom and pop shops out of town when we took down all the little cheap buildings. And so the problem is um, that you can build it, but unless the rent of a place like that is um, compatible with the shop, it's not going to be there. And so that's the reason why we entertain the thought of um, having enough with five stories, enough residential space so that somehow the developer could um, charge less perhaps for the commercial. And if we just open it up and say, well, you know, he can come and apply again because it's empty, then that's that might very well happen. So this is what we're doing. We're trying to put our head together to figure out how can we, if we have enough um, places where a developer can make money, how can we incentivize him to have um, commercial or, you know, public, um, just the kind of businesses that we would love to see. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Nate, you're next. Yeah, I, I've been meaning to do this and I started it was to calculate, you know, the kind of the gross square feet of office and retail on University Drive or in the overlay now. And I guess my question would be, you know, do we want to maintain that number or, you know, or, or some um, proportion of it, right? So, you know, it's kind of, to, uh, we're saying that, you know, if we, if we allow this, you know, are we actually losing space? My thought is we'd actually be gaining it, but I'd want to have kind of that sense, right? So if we, if there's so many square feet now and we allow a certain build out of the overlay, you know, is 50% going to get us what we have at least now or more than what we have now? And so I don't know if that would help with the decision. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I kind of, a, I like the idea of maybe requiring it and they design it and they build it and then, you know, maybe a separate permit if they can't fill it. Um, but we'd have to have some pretty good reasons why that's the case. Um, you know, I, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, thanks, Nate. Janet. So I'm concerned. I'm concerned. Like, I mean, so just looking around town now, and it's, I don't want to look at this moment of time because life goes on and the economy changes and everything, but the, the mixed use buildings in town that have had like, you know, the open spaces, a lot of the owners are actually people who have owned, um, um, rental property and maybe aren't really that familiar with the, the um, you know, commercial market or retail or, you know, renting professional offices, or maybe they don't need to, to make a profit. And so there's a few mixed use buildings in town that have open spaces and they seem to be thriving and the people who have owned them have gone on to build other mixed use buildings. So, you know, I think it's, I hope I get my numbers wrong. I, right. I mean, one East present, East Pleasant Street had protocol that came in after five or six years. And you could say, you know, they couldn't fill that space, but they were obviously making enough money to build two more buildings in town, right? And so, you know, the same thing is true on um, Main Street um, on, I can't remember, Mr. Roblowski's building has never filled that small space. And then he has some empty spaces now um, where there previously were some offices. So part of me thinks is, the rental market is so lucrative, <clears throat> it's subsidizing these empty spaces. And so, and then part of me thinks, you know, it's just, you know, retail's taken this big hit because of COVID and we're not sure where re retail or commercial is going right now. But I think if you're going to get an exception, it should be not that, oh, I couldn't fill this building, this space is, I'm not making any money in this building anymore because of this empty space. If you're making enough money on, on your re rentals to subsidize an empty space, you're doing pretty good. You know, hopefully you'd want to bring in some small businesses just to keep the, the street thriving. It's probably not going to put you into profits. But I think I think that, you know, when we look around town, everybody who has had an empty space has gone on to build more buildings. And so it's not like people are going bankrupt because they had some, you know, 50% or 30% of commercial space. So I, if you're going to do an exemption, put it on their economic profitability, not I just couldn't find anyone to fill this space. 
because I think it's I've actually read this in the small towns thing. It's sort of a phenomenon where the owners often don't really want to deal with commercial tenants because they're more work or the spaces are too small. So you have more tenants. They rather just build the big space, leave it empty and have apartments upstairs. So I think we have to put that exception exemption or you know the permit in a way that really says like show us your numbers and i also know that everybody hates to show numbers but at least say if you are losing money on this building because of this 30 percent commercial space on the first floor then we'll give you the exemption but you have to show that to us okay uh nate Oh, that was not a hand. Okay. All right. You want to move on in the list? Yeah, I, I yeah, I think we we can work on that. Um, we haven't talked too much about the cap on number of apartments or size of buildings. I think that could be under number three. Uh, I think there's a few hands raised, but I you know I think that's another important piece. You know, do we, you know. If we're not looking for massive buildings, is it, you know, it could be both through unit counts or through, um, you know, um, you know, uh, building law coverage or other things that we have built, you know, into this. So. All right. Looks like Janet has a thought. Um, I have a, a possible add to the list and I'd be interested in Nate's thoughts about or other people. Um, I can't remember where this is. I think it's in the apartment section of the um, zoning bylaw where there's a requirement of a mix of unit sizes. I don't know if it's two or three, I can't remember, or you can't have 50% of, of any one kind. And I wondered, you know, we have a bunch of mixed use buildings that are like all studios or, you know, all one bedrooms. And is there a negative to that? Or do we want to say we want a mix of bedroom types and you know, you can have your studios, you can have your one bedrooms, throw in a three bedroom or two. Like what, what, like Nate, what's your impression is how are those buildings working? Are they good? It doesn't matter, you know, the unit mix. Yeah, I think, you know, um, I mentioned that, you know, for affordable housing developments, if they use, you know, a tax credit program it requires 10% be three bedrooms or larger. And so, um, you know, what I, what I've heard is that the developers will put uh, you know, we're, we require um, no more than 50% be one bedroom size, and that's fairly new. And we, we applied it to mixed use buildings and apartments. Okay. Unless, unless they're all affordable, and then it could be all one size. But what I found is developers, you know, will put, you know, right now, it's, um, studios ones and twos, they usually put uh, the twos in corners where they can find the space, uh, maybe between stairs and elevators. Uh, and then they, you know, will uh, work the um, the proportions to meet our you know the requirement. Um, you know I don't you know I, I when we first did this there were a few property managers that would say well you know we we don't want to have a lot of three bedroom units because we have trouble filling those um, you know or you know they might say it might be have difficult filling certain sizes I don't you know um, but I think that's a preference I think that you know I've seen more developers that will have different bedroom counts so. Uh, I don't, I don't think it's a bad, I don't think it's a bad thing. I, you know, the question, you know, I guess my question would be, are we trying to get different tenants, you know, different end users by having different bedroom sizes? Yeah. Um, and you know, maybe that, maybe that's okay. It's really hard to have, uh, typically that kind of the internal control. So, you know, we could have something like that proportion of bedrooms or 10% be a certain size. I don't know if we could do much more than that. I don't. I don't know if it's a problem. I. I think that, you know, it might. It actually might make um, a developer, you know, think about it a little bit more. But you know, if, if we're if we're providing enough incentive in this overlay in terms of development potential, is that you know, right? Is that enough to deter it? Right. So you know, we we put some of these controls in here in this overlay, and wow, it doesn't get used for two years. Maybe we're missing something. We we could revisit it. But if we think we want that. We could try it, right? We could have kind of a no more than fifty percent and at least ten percent be three bedrooms or something, right? And we have some conditions in there. I, I I think that's okay for now. I don't. I haven't heard enough to say no. What about like two bedrooms? Because it seems to me a one bedroom 
you know, you can, you know, a friend of mine had two sisters and she and her, she had a family of five living in a one bedroom apartment in New York. They all were, they're intensely close you know, as adults, but I, it strikes me that at least two bedrooms for a family. And I wonder if, if, if everything's a studio or one bedroom, is that going to just push families out or just not, you know, like what's the minimum for, to get a family in? Yeah, I mean, we'd say a two bedroom, right? You could essentially get, um, you could have four ten, you know, four users, four people in that, four persons in a two bedroom, mm -hmm. and you know, when you calculate, say, rent, rental amounts, you know, you can take the average. So with a two bedroom, it could be anywhere from two users to four, you know, persons. So then, when you do a say like an affordable rent calculation, you would say, you know, you take all those number of uh, persons in a household so a, a three bedroom even you know gets you a lot more mm -hmm. potential persons in that in that unit so you know I, yeah, I agree i think a two a two bedroom would be allows the flexibility of having you know a multiple person household more than a studio or one and 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 at least based on some of the large larger buildings downtown you know they at least one of those has a number of four bedrooms without very much living space, which is clearly geared to students. Right. So, you know, would you want to not allow four bedrooms or would you want to limit it to studios, ones and twos and, and have a few threes? I think, I think um, you know, my experience uh, or my, my impression or my memory of the old North Village at UMass was that we had, there were some three bedroom units and there wasn't a lot of demand for those by the graduate families and the undergraduate families. The families tended to live in the two bedroom units, even if they had three generations living there. Um, so that you know, those were young families by and large, and two bedrooms was preferred. At least that's my my memory. So I don't think there's any three bedrooms in the new complex that replaced North Village. Yeah, I'm not sure there is either, actually. Yeah. All right. Uh, you want to move on? I guess, you know, what we saw in time about kind of the capping the number of units in an apartment or in a building or, you know, I guess we haven't really, I guess I still want to talk about that. Is that, is capping the unit count important or is it more about having some massing and design guidelines? You know, we, I think we could, you know, because we do have this unit type mix, which I think um, yeah. is something we, we can work on. As well, yeah. well, I, I mean, I kind of picked a hundred as an arbitrary number. Um, you know, if you think about it in terms of massing, I guess I was hoping to have facades that were not longer than say sixty or sixty-five feet wide on the street, and um, the building could go back from there, however far it needed to, to get to a hundred. You know, at at um, five stories, four of which are residential, say four and a half, um, you know, you probably have 20, 20 apartments on each floor. So from a sort of hallway point of view, that's not super long, but it's kind of medium. And so, what, but, but whether they're small units or big units, um, you know, that certainly would have a big impact on the, the actual mass of the building. Um, but I don't think it's bad to have a mix of some smaller buildings and some bigger buildings. Um, that would be fine. I think it might even be desirable. So if I had a 100 unit studio building next to a 100 unit three bedroom unit building, that might be fine. I don't know. And, uh, but I don't know how to sort of do a massing criteria for the depth of the building. To me, that's starting to get into the lot area. And um, then you get into how much of the, how much, you know, if you have a hundred units and you need a half of parking space per unit, that's 50 parking spaces. 
you know, how much of those parcels is a 50, you know, is a 50 foot or a 50 spot parking uh, lot? I don't really know, you know, and then you need to get back there. So are you, is the access off of University Drive or is there a sort of service alley that runs parallel to the University Drive farther back? Uh, you know, that tends to be a, is that a private way? Then you need to have multiple owners who are coordinating the location and easement access and that kind of thing. So the access is probably off of University Drive. And then, then you've got a 15 or 20 foot vehicular drive between buildings. Janet. I'm actually starting to fade, but I do love this discussion. And I do think there, um, what you're talking about is really interesting to me because I, you know, I look at the lot sizes and think what's possible there. And that's way beyond my wheelhouse. But I, I wonder if maybe we could dip into that or the facades and the treatments. Because I do think the variety is really key to something that's like an exciting place to live or to shop at. And so, it, you know, what the facade and the width of it, I think, is um, really important. I just I I wonder if we want to get some public comment for people who have sit here sat here patiently if they have anything to add, but I I wouldn't mind ending the meeting like in the next twenty minutes or so just as a personal. Okay. Yeah, I was kind of thinking about nine thirty as a. Yeah. Good time to stop. <laughs> uh, let's see. I don't I don't see any other hands. Chris. I was just going to suggest that we look at, and, and I think we can do this in the office, but look at the buildings that have been built downtown and think about what their facade lengths are like. Because, um, you know, I think some of the buildings like, say, One East Pleasant, well, you may not like the fact that it's right up on the street, but I think the massing of the building is pretty good and its configuration is pretty good. And it's, you know, it's got a, a fairly long facade against the street that I don't find oppressive. I find it oppressive that it's so close to the street, but not the length of the facade itself. On the other hand, there is another building that's going up now that is has a facade that is really long. And so I was just going to encourage people to think about the various buildings that are, have been built recently in the downtown. There's Spring Street, there's one, one East Pleasant, there's Kendrick Place, there's 11 and 13 East Pleasant. And think about what you, um, I won't say like, because not everybody likes those buildings, but kind of like think about the proportions of those buildings and what works and what doesn't work. And that might help to inform this discussion because just saying, you know, facade lengths less than 60 feet that doesn't mean anything to me. It um, and sixty feet isn't that long, so um, you know, just just think about that a little bit, and maybe we can come back and have a little bit more of a richer, more informed discussion about this next time around. Okay, uh, Fred. Fred, you are muted. Sorry about that. I clicked on it, but I didn't click it on just the right place. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, wondering uh, how we're doing in town with the uh, staff knows uh, in terms of uh, commercial occupancy, because those are supposed to be commercial on the first floor. Are they just standing open or are they starting to fill those? Fred, uh, Chris, or Nate, do you want to comment? Well, I, yeah, would say I think Gab Gabrielle has done a really good job of trying to fill a lot of the spaces downtown. I don't know what's going on with 11 and 13 East Pleasant, but I know of the smaller buildings downtown, she's really worked very hard on getting those places filled. So I'm sorry, Nate, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I mean, I was going to say, I think we had mentioned that some sat vacant. I feel like it's been an awkward few years, but there's, it seems like they're starting to fill up. And so, um, you know, yeah, I think it's a, it is a really good question, though. I mean, for instance, um, you know, there's some upper floor vacancies for non-residential space in older buildings downtown that have been vacant for years, but some of it is, you know, it's not accessible or it's, you know, maybe difficult to access. Uh, you know, there could be other reasons why. Um, 
in terms of facade length, yeah, I looked at what's there. So like, you know, Athena's um, pizza in that building, you know, that's 130 feet, right? And Charter is like 120 feet and Charter uh, commercial, um, you know, and, you know, then there's big Y and the post office is pretty long. So, you know, if you, I mean, to me, the, um, where the Hampshire bike exchange, you know, if that's 130 feet, it's only one floor, but that's, you know, that's over hundred feet. Is that okay? Um, I mean, I, Doug, I do like the idea though of breaking up facades, even on a property and having two buildings. And so I think having an entry drive is okay. Um, you know, if we require, you know, if we try to get some plaza space there, rather than, you know, if we have a, a property that could, ha that could have a 300 foot wide building, I, I don't really think we would want that. Um, yeah, I, I had I had used sixty five feet because most those those buildings downtown right. that are apartment buildings are sort of between fifty two and fifty six feet wide. Uh, that's sort of the optimal depth for an apartment uh, with a center double loaded corridor, and so and and I was just talking about that as the dimension of facing facing on the frontage facing the street. In terms of the depth going back, um, I wasn't terribly worried about that actually. Um, I know that the facade of 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street is very long heading back. And uh, right now it's highly exposed on the north side and you really do see it. Uh, but on the, on the south side, you, you basically don't notice it because it's kind of obscured by, by one East Pleasant. So, you know, if we expect things to kind of fill in even along that stretch, you know, maybe the, where that M and T bank is the next piece to get built, um, you know, that long facade is likely to get obscured. So um, I was, you know, the, the dimension I threw out was about the frontage yep. and, um, you know, I mean, 130 feet, that may be fine also, but it's, it's starting to, you know, I mean, I mean, it's fine at Athena's, but if we took Athena's and went for five stories, we might feel differently. Yeah, no, but I, so, I, yeah. I, I mean, I'm not adamant about that particular dimension. No, I, I agree. I do think that at some point, you know, we have to, if, if you know, I think the, it's cheaper to build a box than have some articulation or step backs. And I think at some point we, we would actually want to require that, um, you know, in a break in plane more than, you know, when we did our BL overlay, I think we said, you know, like a foot or something to me, I'd want more than that. You know, I'd want, you know, so anyways, well, yeah. There's, I, there's sort of know. two scales of, of breaking on that facade. One is some interest within the building so that it's not just a box. Right. And then there's, the scale of how big is the box? Right. So, you know, I could say, yeah, a 12 inch uh, step within the facade every 20 feet. I mean, you know, so that you don't get a, a flat box. Anyway, I'm talking too much. Bruce. In the interest of wrapping this up around 930 or so, uh, I think I'd like to hear, uh, we've got uh, a number of people still on our uh, attendees and two of them at mm -hmm. least have got their hand up and I'm ready to hear uh, because I know some of these folks have been thinking about this as probably as much as we have. So uh, why don't we stop talking and listen to what others have got to say and then uh, continue it uh, at another date. All right. All right, that's two members in favor of uh, public comment. And Janet, I assume you dropped your hand so that we could go up to public comment. All right, so we have two members of the public. Uh, we'll start with Pam Rooney. Please give us your name and your street address. And you have three minutes. Nate, uh, I have- Pam, uh, Pam Field Sadler, do you have the timer? I'm, I'm working on it. Nate, I'm gonna have to put your uh, screen down, okay? Perfect, thank you. All right, great. Okay. So let's bring over Pam.
Hi, everybody. Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. I really am uh, really appreciate the conversation. And I'm and I'm loving the I'm loving the depth of of the conversation. These are very disparate points, sort of an accumulation of what you've talked about over the evening. Um, the the first item might be the capacity or the cap on number of units. I think that's probably not um, a problem. I think it's really the size of the building, the mass of the building, and let the developer build what they can within that box. Um, let's see. Um, I think Doug mentioned that, you know, having the small end of the building toward the street, a little bit like uh, the example of 70 University Drive, that building seems to work because the the gable end is uh, narrow, it's it's facing the street and you don't get a sense of the, the size of the building. So the actual length of it is is almost immaterial. So I like that. Um, that capability. I like the use of using the secondary road or wh whatever we're calling it um, and taking advantage of all of that land mass, which is buildable, by the way, and not wetland, um, and, and taking advantage of that. So that's good. The commercial aspect of it seems very important because this is really our, this is really our second tier of commercial development in town. It is, it is, you know, besides Route 9, you know, with the car repair shops and everything, you know, as you go toward Belchertown, it's really our only other commercial uh, um, area. And I would love to see it emphasize at least the presence of, oh, and by the way, I'm no longer the, the liaison to the, to the planning board. Oh, okay. uh, at least they haven't they haven't voted me in as as such, so I'm speaking as a person. Um, let's see. yeah, the commercial the commercial aspect is very important, even even if they can create temporary spaces that are used, um, I think that's that's very important. Um, having the the fact that University Drive is really a fairly low speed zone, multiple curb cuts to me seem, totally okay, as long as we re retain a sense of a strong alley, a, a strong sense of street with street trees, I think that's terrific. All right, you're down to 20 minutes, 20 seconds. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, the mix of, of, of um, units, I think somebody mentioned, I think maybe Janet mentioned the mix of units that we currently have for mixed use development may not be a bad thing, um, but it could be lifted if in fact it were um, an incentive to create something else in this zone. Um, and I would, uh, I lost my, I forgot my last point. Right, you're at, you are yeah. out of town. And I'm out of town, I'm out of town. Okay, thank you all. Okay, all right, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, next we will have Susanna Musprat. To bring her over, and Susanna, give us your name and your street address. And we did we did receive your your letter this afternoon. Susanna Musprat, thirty eight North Prospect Street. Um, yeah, thank you for looking at my letter. I'm I was really distressed to hear you just Nate sort of toss out the window the idea that this needs to be a kind of reciprocal agreement between the town and the university. That is where you all started when you started thinking about different areas in town where there could be more development and how that could be used to incentivize the university to do something. And we don't have the bargaining power after we've already changed the zoning um, that we have now to, to open those discussions with the university. It just can't go on that they keep adding more and more students and uh, we have to provide the housing for them. And I think we've reached a breaking point, um, but the other thing I want to emphasize is what I said at the end, that this is a good time to let the community in, get people together in a room where we can all see each other and 
bat around some ideas. Why not hear from more people? Um, and then the final point, um, Oh, I, I hope Nate will try to calculate the current commercial and make sure that we keep at least that amount of commercial space in the uh, in the new plan. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Susanna. And the third hand is from Janet Keller. If we could bring Janet over Oops. and restart the clock. Yep. Janet, you need to unmute. Right, so Janet, Janet Keller, um, uh, street yes. address. My street address is. Um, I do have a street address, <laughs> um, and I'm obviously very anxious. Um, let me come back to it. Um, I live on Pulpit Hill Road, uh, 120 Pulpit Hill Road, up in North Amherst. Thanks. Um, Thank you. So, so um, I too appreciate uh, the richness and uh, the thoughtfulness of the planning board discussion uh, and uh, the, the comments from Susanna and, and Pam. Um, and I want to say what's probably obvious to you, how much I love uh, University Drive between Amity Street and Route 9. And um, a lot of the things that we've all talked about tonight would, uh, if we do them right, uh, preserve what makes that a special place. Um, the greenness, the um, setbacks, um, the size of things in the care and placing them as Pam noted with uh, Barry's building at 70 University Drive. Um, so uh, I, I would say keep up the good work and um, uh, kudos to, to for the discussions tonight. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Janet. Is there anyone else in the public that would like to make a comment? Okay. All right. Um, so I'm seeing it's almost 20 after nine. And uh, maybe we'll have a few more comments. Uh, we've got a couple. We've got the committee and liaison reports to still do before our meeting ends. So uh, if you absolutely need to say something, what, raise your hand. And we've got Nate and Bruce with their hands up. Nate. Sure. Thanks, Bruce. I was just uh, I was going to respond to Susanna. I mean, I didn't throw out the idea of working with UMass, but I don't think that we can, you know, I think we can tell them we're looking at this, you know, we already have, and that we encourage them to think of, you know, how they could respond in terms of development uh, along Northern part of University Drive or, you, or, you know, Mass Ave. But I don't, I don't see it as us saying, well, we're gonna enter into an agreement, some binding agreement or contract with UMass requiring them to do something because we're doing this. So I, I see that as actually a great opportunity for the town to look at this section of University Drive, whether or not UMass, you know, takes advantage of it. I think we can take advantage of it. And I think we can encourage them to, you know, to build upon it, but I don't think we can require them to do something or get into a contract. So I, I still think that, you know, with the planning board had a conversation with Tony and Nancy, and I think we'd like to have it again. And I think we can continue these discussions about how we can partner with the university uh, and have that you know, a reciprocal relationship, but I don't see it as a kind of a contract. So, um, or a requirement that they do something. I, I, so I don't want to belittle that. I think it's a really important um, piece you brought up. So I just think that, you know, we're, we're trying to keep the dialogue open and collegial. And I think that's where I'd like to go with that. All right. 
Thanks, Nate. Bruce. Um, I just wanted to ask Nate, I purposely kept this to the end because uh, I sent you, Nate, a, an email later in the day. I know whether you saw it, but uh, I'm prepared to put some time and effort into doing some kind of build-out studies, which basically I might need guidance on and so forth. But, you know, I'm probably able to do this sort of thing with some reasonable guidance. I, uh, I take some of the load off and so forth. Um, but I would need to, to get the, the documentation. Is 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 it possible that uh, I give you a call? We can, um, I can I can produce some hopefully useful uh, um, uh, numerical studies or whatever we call it. I mean, I think Doug, you've been doing this, or uh, and I haven't seen it, but I think it could be uh, helpful. And and if if uh, and I've got some time, I could probably spend a few hours on this over the next uh, month or so. Yeah. Yeah. Bruce, I saw your email. So, you know, I think we can talk later this week, or early next week and, you know, whether it's taking the GIS and making it into like a, we can put it in a CAD file and have it be scaled to a certain size, whatever we can talk about it, what you would want. So, yeah. Yes. I've got the software to do all this sort of stuff. I can do it. I just uh, wasn't able to download the basic files in a way that would I could import them in a way that was sensible and, and a few other things. So with a small amount of uh, briefing and support, I think I could probably be uh, I could probably be helpful. So I'll try and be so. Right. Okay. Janet, last last thoughts on this topic? Um, <laughs> for this evening, I think this is I think that um, this is an opportunity to t start talking to some of the planners at UMass. Um, and I, I, you know, we need to open that door. We could open that door and start working together because they're going to have all sorts of information about what the university's plans or may just ideas, what they think students want or, you know, what's going on with the different dorms and things like that. If there are plans for University Drive, but maybe it's not University Drive, maybe it's Mass Ave. And so I think we should just, sit down over sandwiches and just have, you know, meet with some planners and just say, hey, we're working on this. What are your thoughts? Because you guys, you know, we all live here and we're all working with the same population. So I, I think we should just take this opportunity to just start talking and, and picking people's brains and seeing what's going on. I totally appreciate Nancy and Tony coming, but they're really, you know, it's their kind of communications liaisons and not to disinvite them because I'll have a sandwich really with anybody especially if this coffee. Um, but I just think it'd be a good opportunity to sort of sit down with some of the planning staff and just say, hey, this is what we're looking at. Are you guys looking at this part? Or do you have ideas for a university drive? Because a lot of us who live here are just staring at it and thinking about it. So I hope you can think of some way to open the door and just chat. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, maybe Chris and Nate, that's probably a conversation for you guys with... Uh... Dave or Paul, I suppose. Okay, all right, so time is 924 and we will conclude this conversation for this evening. Uh, Nate, I hope we've given you at least a head start on where we wanna go. Um, and then Chris, I hope uh, you and Nate will come back to us on when, when you wanna schedule this on our agenda next. Okay, all right, why don't we move back into the rest of our agenda. Um, we were up to our planning board committee and liaison reports. Bruce, PVPC. Uh, nothing to report though. There is a meeting next Thursday. So uh, on the um, sixth, I might have something. Oh, actually, no, it'll be the night before the next meeting. So we won't have that, but there is a meeting coming up shortly and and I do see their notes and things that are circulated and I read them and but uh, it's fairly dry and there's nothing that I think uh, I would pass on from what I've seen that's been uh, circulated that's useful here tonight. Okay. Um, I don't have anything new to report on CPAC. We haven't had a meeting in the last couple of weeks and uh, I don't expect us to have very many meetings for quite a while. Uh, Karen, Design Review Board. Uh, we met on Monday. Christine was there. Uh, two very positive things. 
there's going to be, we approved the taking down of the awning and uh, of a, a really exciting new little shop market, uh, Aster and Pine, which is on 189 North Pleasant. It's kind of where that Vinci hair salon was. So they're going to have wine and cheese and local produce. And um, they're very wonderful young couple. So it's very exciting. It's something that's really needed in town. Um, and the other thing was 55 South Pleasant, which is where Hastings was. Uh, that's kind of an ongoing thing, but that's also, I think, a, a wonderful development in the center of town. They're going to take down the wooden, and we proof that, uh, they're going to take down the wooden structure that is now, you know, kind of dilapidated and hasn't been used for a long time. And there, in in that place, is going to be the Amherst College store in in the old uh, Hastings store, and and then in the space where the structure is coming down, there's a, a bit of an arcade, an open space, very beautifully designed, I think. And going back to a tower, which is five stories, by the way, and hidden a little bit behind it is a five-story apartment building, which I think Barry Roberts uh, is developing and owns. The whole thing is very attractive. There will be less cars going into that very uh, narrow space because a lot of parking behind there is going to be gone. Instead, the building will be larger. And it just looks inviting. We talked a lot about the design, the different colors, the way that it's structured. It's going to be fine-tuned and, and they're open to advice. But uh, both of those, I think, are going to be real additions for the center of town. So yeah, it was nice. OK, great. Thanks, Karen. Um, Janet, your hand is up. Karen, could we get a picture, some pictures of that? Because I just saw a picture in the Gazette that I could hardly see. I'd be interested in seeing the changes. Do you, could you send us those docs or? Uh, are the design review board packets on the town website? That's what I was just going to say. Go on the town website, look at the design review board page and go to um, their packets and you can see all about this project there. It, it must be the late hour. I should have thought of that. Sorry. Okay. All right. Um, next, we will have Chris, uh, CRC, anything? So the CRC is still um, dealing with the rental registration um, bylaw that is uh, slowly moving through. Um, they will be taking on the solar bylaw soon. I understand they have been... Um, wanting to be in touch with me about that. And so um, we'll be hearing more about that. Um, they, I, I told Pam and Doug that the CRC experienced Zoom bombing last night and um, it was very unfortunate and ugly language. And um, you know, so we discussed a little bit about how to handle it. Unfortunately, there's been a recent court case that kind of says that we need to let people say what they want to say, but there are obviously limits on it. And the limitation that we were given by Dave Zomek, who was at the CRC, he said, well, it, you know, if there's hate speech involved, then you can cut it off. Um, and obviously the chair can cut it off if it doesn't have anything to do with the uh, subject at hand. But um, for general comment period, there's it's it's difficult to limit the speech unless it is hate speech. So. Um, just, you know, bear with us as we try to learn how to deal with this. Uh, Chris, is it true that we don't really have to have public comment period? Well, public comment period is required by the charter. Uh, so everybody who has a board or committee is supposed to have a, a period of public comment. Um, but, and, and you know, the there's charter... nothing in state law that says you have to have public comment, is, if All that's right. what you're asking. Well, and does the charter say how frequently we need to do that? I think it you have to have it at every meeting. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, so we're up to the report of the chair and the chair has no report tonight. 
How about staff? Any report from staff? How, well, you, you're going to have another staff member soon or not? Hopefully, we just were able to post the planner position. Um, HR put it up, I don't know, Monday, I guess. And so we're hoping that we get some uh, response to that because we, we didn't have a very easy time of it the first two times that we um, we sought another planner, but we really need another planner. So hopefully we'll get one soon. Well, maybe there are some planners graduating this spring from UMass who want to mm -hmm. stay in town. Yep. Okay, is that it from staff? That's all I have for now, yep. Okay, and so our next meeting is next week, right? That's right, mm -hmm. yes. And that's a continuation of the um, Fort Rivers School um, public hearing. And we haven't received any new information, but I did send an email to the um, architect today to ask if he was planning to include anything in, in your packet that's going out on Friday. So hopefully he'll be responsive to that. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Bruce? Uh, Doug, uh, um, I tuned into the zoning board uh, hearing uh, on the school uh, last Thursday, just because I was curious to see how they would handle it and so forth. And, um, and in the conversation, that uh, uh, Tim was uh, Tim Cooper was orienting the zoning board. He uh, uh, and and uh, on the subject of the uh, PV arrays, uh, he mentioned that uh, the array that the the, the 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 mounted array that was close to the western uh, property boundary. He mentioned, I think, as a kind of a sentence, said that the planning board wasn't very pleased with this. Some some version, something like that. And that uh, he suggested, I think, if I recall, that they were intending to do make some revision to that. So, Chris, I think we would definitely want to, if they're going to, if they're going to have a revision uh, to their array arrangements, so far as uh, uh, diminishing the uh, intrusion into the setback, that would be something to look forward to. I may be wrong, but that's what I heard. Okay, Chris. Yeah, uh, Bruce reminded me that um, the. The Zoning Board of Appeals did approve the structures in the FPC zoning district. Um, so that was the result. They gave a special permit for those structures um, in the FPC. And they were puzzled about why we have an FPC if we already have a 100-year floodplain, no, FEMA, FEMA floodplain uh, overlay district. But in any event, they did approve it. And um, so that was good. OK. And is the existence of the FPC something we should talk about in a future meeting? Yes. So we can put that in our list of things to talk about. Mm -hmm. OK. All right. Anybody have anything else to, to mention? If not, I see the time. Oh, Nate. Yeah, just quickly, that the, the project uh, Karen mentioned um, 45 and 55 South Pleasant, that's coming to the planning board for site plan review. So it's expected that in March, that would probably be, you know, a, the opening of the public hearing for that. So, you know, you can look on the DRB packet and then, the, you know, just knowing that it will become, um, you know, planning board application as well. Okay. No other hands that I see. Time is 9.34. And thanks for hanging in there. We are adjourned. Thank you. See you next week. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Uh,